Here. Trustee Clark. Here. Trustee Collin. Here. Trustee Davis Ward. Here. Trustee Levison. Present. Trustee Rosner. Here. Trustee Schnall. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Lerner's absent. Mr. Rother. Here. Susan Calgene. Present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Please stay standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, a couple of announcements to get us started tonight. Um, the first is the Coffee with the Cop program. Really excited and pleased to be able to announce the first meeting. Um, and thanks to Trustee Collin and the Public Safety Committee for organizing this along with the community policing unit at um, our police department. Um, so this is a chance for residents to informally get together, discuss any issues with any of our police officers um, that they might have. So it's a great opportunity to ask questions, get to know our officers, um, and really part of our, all of our commitment to trying to make um, uh, our community more engaged with our police department. So the first one is Thursday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Um, and that is at the First Baptist Church, and we thank them for allowing us to use their space um, for this meeting. Um, and uh, I know we'll be announcing um, uh, subsequent dates for more meetings um, after that point. If you'd like a meeting in your particular neighborhood or if you would like to meet with an officer one-on-one, -on -one, um, feel free to get in touch with us and we will try and set that up for you. Um, a reminder about the File of Life program. Um, so the Village has expanded the File of Life program. This consists of medical and personal um, information that goes on an emergency card that you place on your refrigerator. Um, as a first responder myself, I know this is something that is very valuable to first responders. Um, so it's things where you list things like your uh, medications, your past medical history, um, anything that any first responder might need to be aware of. Um, and you put it right, and you can put it in your home and in your vehicle. Um, so if you would like to get one of those, you can contact our health department at 973-378-7715, extension 7710. Um, and we're very excited. Uh, South Orange's Restaurant Week starts today and goes till Sunday, April 19th. Um, the Restaurant Week is possible through the generous support of Investors Savings Bank and the Lickman Radney team of Keller Williams. Um, most of the participating restaurants are offering 15% off. If you go to sovillagecenter.org, you can find a complete listing of all the restaurants that are participating um, and also all the details of the program. So we certainly encourage folks to head on down um, downtown and check out all of our restaurants, um, especially this week. Uh, I want to give a special thanks um, to everybody that was involved in organizing our senior prom this weekend. Um, we had an incredible turnout, um, at least 80 to 90 people, maybe 100 at the, at the max. Um, Trust to come, I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to add about that. It was, it was amazing. I went in a ball gown. Um, it was um, Nan Salmons and Peg Sinberg and Tonya Moore. And we had, I think it was over 100 people. And the group is already discussing the next kind of social activity to bring seniors 65 and older um, together. And a special thanks to the Division of Volunteer Efforts at Seton Hall University, who's so gracious as in your mic. Steve, normally people can hear me. It's for the TV. Oh, OK. Um, who's wonderful hosts. And they donated the food and the space. And this is a great partnership between the senior citizens and Seton Hall. And there was also a lot of other volunteers involved. Um, so I thank them as well. Great. Um, I also want to make sure to thank uh, Trustee Clark um, and others for a very successful uh, tree sapling giveaway. Um, Trustee Clark, it sounded like there were 91 uh, given out. Is that correct? That is correct. 92. Uh, slight update. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thank you for um, organizing that. And that was um, uh, a program that um, so are there any that are left if there are South Orange residents um, there, who had damage from? There are a couple left. Um, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how long they will last because they were the, they're were they bare root, so they have nothing to really to sustain them. So I've, I've held on to them. I'm watering them. I'm getting sun. I'm going to talk to the public works director to see if he can make use of them. Um, and uh, But in the meantime, if anybody else wants either a Kausa dogwood or a willow oak, uh, please contact me. Work it out. Thank you. Um, and just a, uh, a quick note, um, Mayor DeLuca of Maplewood and myself um, co-signed a letter 
um, that we sent to the Essex County freeholders today, um, and that is asking for uh, Middlesex County launched a really interesting program um, where they're providing uh, free college tuition credit um, at Middlesex County College for volunteer firefighters and EMTs. <laughs> um, so there's a state program that provides a very small amount of support for that. Uh, Middlesex County expanded on that, um, and um, especially these days with how expensive college is and how many students are graduating with an enormous amount of debt, um, it would seem like a great program to be able to offer um, some opportunity for educational advancement, um, especially for the volunteer firefighters and the EMTs that even many of whom in, you know, throughout this very difficult economy that we've had for the past three years, five years, um, they're still volunteering 10, 20, 30 hours a week, um, you know, at their rescue squad or at their fire department. Um, and so we sent that um, over today. Um, you know, we both have volunteer squads in each of our towns. There's many other towns in Essex County um, that would potentially benefit from that. Um, so hopefully that is um, something that the freeholders um, can uh, consider um, for those volunteers. Yeah, I just want to add to the final life. Uh, part of the program, which is new, is that the st there's a sticker that goes along with the in-car final life, which is a yellow sticker that you put on your back bumper. So it's, it's important that that be a component of the, that, that description. That's right, because yeah, that allows, um, there's a car accident or anything like that, allows responders to identify that and know that there is information handy for them to be able to call. Right. Did you have one okay. more? Yeah, I'll try and speak loud enough. So as the board knows, um, we lost a, a wonderful person in our community, um, Laura Nichols from Blue Plate Special. Very emotional past couple of weeks for a lot of people. Um, just within context, Laura was the first business um, owner <laughs> appointment to the Urban and Avenue Corridor Advisory Committee that the board established in early uh, 2013. And um, the Seton Village Committee, now renamed, is looking at opportunities to honor her memory and the energy and everything that she brought to one of the board's initiatives. She was a really big driver behind a lot of the work that we've done over there um, as an organizer, as a business owner, and somebody who is probably more creative and loving and caring and exciting than anybody I've ever met before. So um, stay tuned for some recommendations on what we can do moving forward from the Seton Village Committee to honor her memory and legacy as um, an outstanding community member, business owner, and a volunteer on one of our advisory committees. Thank you. I think that uh, you know we can speak for the entire board when we say that anything that we can do to honor that memory, we certainly will. Um, okay, um, so that's all the announcements. We have a, uh, a presentation this evening, um, and I would ask Trustee Collum, um, who was involved in sort of getting some of this set up, to just give a very brief introduction, and then we'll um, welcome the presenters up here. Uh, sure. So having worked with a few folks who are in the audience, I see Carol and Jackie and Lisa. Um, I, I was, it was probably about a few months ago that I was asked, you know, what do I think about cats? And I asked about, you know, it, I, I haven't seen it on Broadway yet, but I'm sure it's great. <laughs> uh, I hadn't realized kind of this momentum um, around trap, neuter, and release. Um, and, and I started diving in. I'm allergic to cats. I don't know too much about that but I started learning a little bit more about the program, um, its successes, some of its challenges, and most importantly, I started seeing some of these other municipalities um, pilot these programs, such as Maplewood, um, West Orange, um, and it, it seems to be gaining some traction. Um, our Board of Health, also representatives, are here because ultimately this falls within their jurisdiction, but as always, I kind of feel it's good for all of us to see the same information, the same facts, and have a conversation as a group as to whether this is something that could or um, couldn't work in South Orange. So I think that conversation is beginning today. The village has provided um, the information to Michelle, who's going to be making the presentation, for us to evaluate the numbers and ultimately work with our colleagues on the Board of Health, community members, and also experts who have addressed the situation and moving forward. Um, and tonight we have a, an amazing presenter who's going to share some analysis um, from her professional expertise and working in other municipalities who have examined this program as well. Okay, thank you. So if you'd like to um, come up to at this point, come up to the podium there. And just a reminder to try and keep the presentation to 10 or 15 minutes, um, and that will give the board, if there's any questions, an opportunity to ask them as well. Sure. Is this on? Is this working? 
Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I'm sorry I had to reschedule earlier. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to work this. Okay. My name is Michelle Lerner. I'm an attorney and policy specialist at the Animal Protection League of New Jersey, where I focus on providing technical support to municipal governments around the issue of trap, neuter, return. Just a quick outline of. Um, okay. Can people hear me better? Okay. Um, so uh, just a quick outline of what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to briefly talk about traditional animal control approaches to feral cat control and why they have not been working well. What South Orange's current approaches, based on some data that I looked at and, and ordinances, how trap neuter return can help the village and what my recommendations are if the village decides to pursue that. So feral cats are unsocialized cats normally born outside, normally who live outside either individually or in groups that are called colonies. Um, based on mathematical models developed by experts based on human population, a conservative estimate is that South Orange likely has more than 1,000 feral cats within its borders. There are three methods of feral cat, um, methods of controlling feral cats that municipalities in the United States have generally traditionally used. One is to do nothing at all, which has not been very successful. Um, the second is trap and remove, <coughs> which is also referred to as trap and kill, where animal control officers respond to complaints about particular cats and go and trap them, impound them for seven days, which is required by New Jersey law, and then euthanize them um, because they're not adoptable. So that's what happens with impounded feral cats. And the third is feeding bans. Uh, South Orange has been using trap and remove and a feeding ban to try to control the feral cat population. So trap and remove has not worked anywhere in the United States for mathematical reasons. Cats are, have a very high reproductive rate. They can have up to three litters per year. In this climate, it's usually two litters per year and up to six or seven kittens per litter. It's very common for them to have litters of four or five kittens twice a year. So studies of feral cat populations have shown that in order to stabilize the population, keep it from increasing, not decrease it, at least 50% of the cats have to be removed every year. And to decrease the population, not eliminate it, but to decrease it, at least 75% have to be removed every year. Otherwise, the remaining cats reproduce more quickly than the cats are being removed. So the problem and why this hasn't worked anywhere is that animal control officers can't remove enough cats to stay ahead of the reproductive curve. If South Orange has 1,000 feral cats, the animal control officers would have to trap and impound 750 cats per year in order to reduce the population that way. And there are no human resources to be able to trap that many cats. There's nowhere to impound that many cats. Even if they focused on one particular area and just removed all of the cats from there, if there are uncontrolled populations surrounding it, the cats just move into the vacated area. It's called the vacuum effect, and it's been studied. So this situation where cats are being removed at a slower rate than they're reproducing has been referred to by a past president of the National Animal Control Association in an interview that I included in your materials packet as being like bailing the ocean with a thimble. This approach is also too expensive to be able to work to, to reduce the population as a primary method. <coughs> right now, um, South Orange is using Associated Humane Society in Newark, which charges the village $90 per cat to impound for seven days and euthanize. If the village were to try to reduce a population of 1,000 cats, um, by you'd have to impound 750 cats per year at $90 a cat. That's over $67,000 a year just for impoundment and euthanasia fees. Um, which wouldn't include you know, the extra animal control officers you would have to hire for that labor. For this reason, in the same interview, the past president of the National Animal Control Association said, talking of the whole country, there's no department I'm aware of that has enough money in their budget to simply <coughs> practice the old capture and euthanize policy. The other problem with it is that residents tend to not cooperate with it. People who are feeding cats will not report them to the town or look for help with them if they think or know that the cats will be killed as a result, and most of their neighbors won't either. They'll just tolerate them being there. 
So in general, most cats within the borders of a municipality remain unreported, reproducing, unvaccinated, until they reproduce to the extent that there are so many that they create nuisances that are big enough that somebody is willing to report them to the municipality. So that's trap and remove. Feeding bans also do not work to reduce populations. They're no longer a popular method of control. There are very few municipalities in New Jersey that have feeding bans that apply to cats. The reason they don't work is twofold. One, um, studies have shown that one in six Americans feed feral or stray cats, so that's a huge portion of your residents. They do so out of compassion for animals that are born or show up outside where they live. And if there's a feeding ban, they don't stop feeding, they just do it more discreetly. They tend to do it at night, which is worse for many reasons. Um, so, and it's almost impossible to enforce a feeding ban to an extent that would stop the feeding of enough cats in the town to make a difference. The other reason that it doesn't work is that cats that stop being fed don't just evaporate. They don't migrate en masse to the next town. They don't tend to drop dead in the streets. Um, cats are resilient. They're very territorial. They stay where they are. They just go into garbage cans and dumpsters. Um, they start to hunt. They may be thinner and less healthy, more vulnerable to parasites, but they remain and they keep reproducing. Um, I'll talk about this more in a second, but Maplewood passed a feeding ban and actually saw the number of cats increase as a result. The other problem with these two approaches is that they are not good for rabies control, which is of concern to most municipalities in New Jersey, because there are a lot of cats that remain from these two methods of control, and the remaining cats tend to be unvaccinated, and because they also tend to be unneutered, they are constantly creating more unvaccinated cats. So in terms of what South Orange is doing, um, right now you have a feeding ban, an ordinance that applies to stray and feral cats, and you practice trap and remove, also um, referred to as trap and kill. I like to generally talk about the trends over a period of years in a municipality. It's hard to do that in South Orange because there weren't a lot of animal control records kept. Um, I requested three years worth uh, to be able to analyze. I think I requested them in December. The only impoundment records that existed were from March to August of 2014, and the only complaint records were for June to November of 2014. But what we can tell from what there was is that from between mid-March to mid-August of 2014, which is only five months, um, the village impounded 30 cats and kittens, 80% of those were feral adults or kittens, so the main issue is cats feral cats reproducing outside. Of the 30, 21 were euthanized and two died, so that's a 76% death rate, which is very high for New Jersey. Um, in terms of complaints about cats, between June and November, which is a different but overlapping five-month period, there were 49 complaints about stray and feral cats or kittens, and most of the complaints mentioned there being multiple cats or kittens per complaint. So what this shows is that despite having a feeding ban and practicing fairly aggressive trap and remove for a small town, there are still many cats. The cats seem to be reproducing and are probably unvaccinated, and at least some residents are starting to get frustrated with the numbers. I was asked to talk, because there's so little data for South Orange, I was asked to briefly talk about Maplewood's data as a sister city because they, they did have um, pretty good animal control records. So when I looked at their data, it was interesting. In 2010, they impounded 36 cats and kittens for the whole year, um, which was a, comp, a pretty um, average number for preceding years. But that year, they passed a strict feeding ban with um, high financial penalties for feeding. After that, complaints about feral cats and kittens doubled. Residents started in reporting increasing numbers, especially of kittens, and by 2012, two years later, the impoundment rate had more than doubled to 84 cats and kittens. So why would cats increase with the feeding ban? The reason from looking into it is that residents were still feeding the cats, and the cats were still there, but what residents stopped doing was asking rescues and individuals who trap to help them with removing kittens and friendly adults, and some of them had been doing trap neuter return or asking for help with that, and they stopped because having big trapping projects called attention to themselves as feeders. They could feed discreetly in the dark behind their house, but they couldn't trap discreetly. Um, and both rescues and people who were trapping reported stopping because of the feeding ban. So because of this, Maplewood now exempts trap, neuter, return cats from their feeding ban. So um, trap, neuter, return 
is something that is a trend across the United States, not just New Jersey, with municipalities. And the reason is that it is more effective at reducing both the numbers of feral cats and complaints about feral cats, because it reduces nuisances. Uh, it has, there's a better public health measures because the remaining, there are fewer cats and the remaining cats tend to be vaccinated against rabies. It's cheaper. It's often covered by grants and donations. There are more human resources available because people volunteer to assist with this, whereas they don't volunteer to assist with, with um, trap and removal for euthanasia. And it's more humane and popular with residents. The way that it works is the feral cats are already there. TNR does not create feral cats. Um, they're there. The people that are trapping go into an area, trap every cat and kitten. Ideally, they remove all of the kittens and friendly adults for adoption. Feral adults are neutered and vaccinated and ear-tipped, which means that while they are under anesthesia getting neutered, the veterinarian removes the tip of their left ear in a straight line so that they are easily visually identifiable as having been neutered and vaccinated. And they are then returned to where they were trapped uh, for continued management, usually under the care of people who were already feeding them. And any newcomers are, are also trapped. The reason this, there are multiple reasons why this works. The main reason this works is that you have a lot more people trapping. If you, for the numbers of feral cats that, that towns have when there's no holistic program, you need a small army of people out trapping to get ahead of the reproductive curve, and that's something that happens with trap neuter return. It's also proactive rather than just being complaint driven. People who are feeding the cats and their neighbors when there's a humane solution tend to come forward and report the cats and ask for help with them. Numbers are reduced immediately through removal and then um, more slowly over time through attrition because the remaining cats aren't reproducing. Cats are vaccinated. It is a lot cheaper around here. The cats can be neutered um, and vaccinated, feral cats, for 50 to $55 versus the $90 the village is paying to uh, impound and euthanize. And there are many grants available for this and people often donate to it. This is not a fringe thing. This really is the trend. Um, the New Jersey Department of Health and a policy that's in the materials I've provided calls it a facet to the solution of the free roaming and feral cat situation. TNR is also accepted or endorsed by the New Jersey Local Boards of Health Association, the Veterinary Subgroup of the American Public Health Association, the International County City Management Association, the New Jersey Legislature, the Governor's Task Force on Animal Welfare, Sustainable Jersey, which put out a white paper and resource compendium for municipal officials on the topic, which is in your materials packet, the National Animal Care and Control Association, the New Jersey SPCA, the ASPCA, the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, in New Jersey, more than 150 municipalities have some form of officially sanctioned trap neuter return program. Um, I have a, my own working list of these municipalities is in your packet because I was presenting in January and they were printed out then. There are, uh, there are more towns than are in there. I know that Wayne passed an ordinance shortly after that. About 50 of the municipalities have ordinances or resolutions and the rest of them, either the animal control officers do the trap neuter return or they work with the nonprofits in a manner other than by ordinance. Um, quickly, some examples of results. There are, there's more data on this in your packet. Um, Englewood reported a 72% reduction in feral cat numbers in the first two and a half years. Morristown, 76% in five years. Cape May, 80% in four years. My own town, Mount Olive Township, um, has seen a 74% reduction in numbers in the colonies in five years. Um, in South Orange, I know I, it may be a minuscule amount, but I know there's been some trap neuter return because in the records I saw that one of the feral cats impounded and killed last summer was ear tipped. So it must have been trap neuter returned, but it may be a small amount, I don't know. It's obviously being done informally. Um, Maplewood residents have set up a 501c3 to do TNR in Maplewood, and it apparently includes some South Orange residents, and they would like to work in South Orange. They negotiated a $50 spay-neuter fee with the local vet, and they've been raising money and doing TNR in Maplewood. Um, so what would South Orange need to do to enable this to happen? Um, there are a lot of options, but the only thing that would, that would have to be done in order to <laughs> enable this to happen is to exempt trap-neuter-returned cats from three existing restrictive ordinances. The first one is the feed ban, um, just as Maplewood did and some other municipalities have done. The New Jersey Department of Health and the policy you have in your packet recommends banning the feeding of feral cats only outside of colonies managed through TNR. 
the New Jersey DEP model stormwater ordin ordinance, which most towns have adopted, banning the feeding of wildlife on public property. Their model ordinance specifically, which is in your packet, specifically states that it's not intended to apply to municipal TNR programs. Um, there are some sample ordinances with exemptions in your packets. It's generally considered a carrot and stick approach to have a feeding ban with an exemption for neutered cats. Um, the second restrictive ordinance that would need an exemption is individual licensing. Feral cats cannot be individually licensed for a number of reasons, which I can get into um, if you want. The Sustainable Jersey paper goes into detail about why that's the case and alternative forms of registration that are available. And the third is the pet limit law. Um, pet limit laws are also not very effective. Most New Jersey municipalities don't have them. When they do, they usually apply to animals that are pets within a household. South Orange is unique or close to unique in having one that applies to any animals being fed on the property, including outside. So there would need to be an exemption from that as well. There are other options, which I can talk about if you have questions, including a full TNR ordinance with a sponsor organization like Maplewood has, a village committee, which some towns do, or animal control officers doing the TNR. Um, I think I've probably gone over the time I was allotted, so just to let you know what's in your packets, there's the Sustainable Jersey White Paper and Resource Compendium, the policy from the State Department of Health, a letter from the Burlington County Health Department about why they initiated a TNR program as a rabies control measure, the working list of New Jersey municipalities with programs, the interview with the past president of the National Animal Control Association, and data and sample ordinances from other New Jersey municipalities. I apologize if I went over for speaking quickly. I usually give a longer presentation. I was asked to give a shorter one here, but to cover data from two towns. So I use my New Jersey speed speaking skills. <laughs> well done. Well, we appreciate that. Um, are there any trustees that have any questions at this point in time? If I, if I could, I'd start by saying thank you for coming all the way from Mount Isle to talk to us tonight. Um, uh, I, I guess one of my questions would be, can you give us a little bit more on how if we were to do this, how we, we could transition, how if we were to do this, we could transition to it uh, in terms of the village and the admin that would be involved in it, uh, as I understand. Um, would we have to outsource all of that, or could the animal control officer be trained to do it? Is there some kind of a training program available somewhere in order to do such a thing? And um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of options. Um, I didn't want to go so long over <laughs> the time I was given, but I can talk to you about them as much as you want. Um, the town can be involved to varying degrees. I think it is more successful when the town is involved usually to a larger degree. Mm -hmm. The town could be as minimally as involved as simply providing an exemption for trap neuter returned cats to those three ordinances <coughs> and allow allowing the nonprofit that's in Maplewood and other residents who want to do trap neuter return to do it, like basically removing the disincentives and penalties and just letting letting it happen. And a lot of it would probably happen, but it might not be as comprehensive as you would want. Right. Another option is to do to pass an ordinance that has a nonprofit as a sponsor entity, like Maplewood did, where the nonprofit um, registers caregivers, does outreach, does trainings, does the trapping, raises the money. There are ways Mount Olive has a nonprofit doing that, but also contributes financially towards it. Um, I think it is always more successful when the animal control officers are always also doing trap neuter return. There are training programs uh, both for individuals and for animal control officers. The Career Development Institute, which is one of the organization or a company that provides uh, certification and training courses for animal control officers um, and health officers, I think, has a course on, on trap neuter return. Um, People for Animals provides training for <coughs> residents and could also help with uh, animal control officers. There are so many municipalities now where the animal control officers do it that they can also pr you know, provide assistance. Um, the entire Bergen County Animal Control Department, which provides animal control for almost 40 municipalities, does trap, neuter, return. I think ideally you would want the animal control <coughs> officers doing it and and nonprofits and individuals, because just as animal control officers cannot trap enough cats to remove them to get ahead of the reproductive curve, they can't trap enough on their own to do TNR to get ahead of the reproductive curve either. So it's really up to 
the village, how, how much you want done and how much you want to get involved. It can be a very limited amount of involvement or it can be a lot of involvement. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh, good presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, uh, my question, it may not be uh, for you to answer, but maybe somebody, our administrator or somebody else could answer, but uh, you talked about there either being disincentives or penalties, in particular, I guess, for the, the feeding ban. Uh, that all matters uh, on enforcement. I'm, I'm curious uh, if we are currently enforcing that right now. Is there any, I mean, I guess my, my question is, will anything change even with a new ordinance if we're not, if we're not currently enforcing that? So. We, we don't have a, a proactive enforcement program. Certainly if complaints came in about illegal feeding and the animal control officer went out there, I would assume they would enforce it. Um, I suspect that the point being is that, you know, those people that, you know, so people that are willing to sort of flaunt the law may do it anyway now, but if they know they don't risk that, then that deterrent component of it is lifted and, and you may get greater participation. I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, I don't know how much South Orange enforces it. I know that people probably who know that they're that these things exist don't call the town for help and there's no help to get and they may not reach out to other people. You won't get nonprofits who can do a lot more of the trap neuter return and do it more comprehensively. You won't get them coming in to do that when there are these ordinances because generally a nonprofit is not going to want to do something that would either be against the law in a town or subject the people that they're helping to fines. Yeah, um, can we do this as a shared service with Maplewood uh, using the 501c3 uh, structure? That's one of the questions. And the other is that I wonder if Frank can talk to what the county is planning on doing or does it have any program uh, for this type of activity? He is. Yeah, he's in the back. I'm looking at him. He's, he's, he's hiding. hiding. He's, he's hiding. hiding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, introduce yourself, Frank, just in case. I'm Frank Calvati. I'm the municipal liaison from Essex County to uh, South Orange. Um, right now, the county, I, I, I heard you mention um, Bergen County. I visited their animal control facility a few years ago, Trustee Levinson, we were working on this, and it was something at the time, just, you know, the, the, the organization and the finances, and every, just about every town in Essex County has their own animal control, some share, um, but, you know, it's a pretty well-established animal control system. To take that on and to build a structure and employ it, it just wasn't feasible at that time. Um, it is something, though, I, we discuss uh, regularly. It's, a, it's an issue, and, uh, you know, the county executive has a soft spot in his heart for animals. So um, it's, it's um, something that is always, it's always comes up in discussion. So I, I, will bring, I will bring that back. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I'm wondering what, what the rest of the board thinks about that being a, uh, or looking at a shared service <coughs> with Maplewood. I'll, I'll comment on that. I speak loud enough. When um, this was first brought to my attention, I was thinking almost exactly what what you just commented on. Is that because we're doing so much together? Um, they are piloting their program right now. It has a definitive end date where, and and I agree with what they did, is they didn't commit that this is going to be right for Maplewood. They said, but there is enough at least evidence um, that would suggest that it could work in Maplewood. So we're going to have a hard cutoff date. Um, originally, it was going to be a little bit shorter, and then the um, advocates came forward and said, based on the numbers, you have to give it enough time to work so you can see results. Just because you implement the TNR program doesn't mean next month, all of a sudden, you've reduced your population in a more um, cost-effective and humane way. You need to allow it to happen over time. Um, and again, this is a lot with what we're going to have to do with the Board of Health to discuss this and obviously hear the response to some of the, the statements and the presentation that, that we received <coughs> is that assuming, assuming the information that we saw is accurate and pertains to us, similarly that data was presented to Maplewood based on the information that um, this group had received, 
is that it seems like it's prime for some type of coordination, collaboration, um, obviously access, and I know some of those folks are here today, access to a nonprofit, whereas we are outsourcing um, with a group that is much better suited and has more capacity than us within our own department with one person right. does um, today. One question I wanted to ask, and I, it's because I watched, I rewatched the meetings from Maplewood. Everything sounds good. It, it looks good. It makes sense. Um, one of the concerns, and it would have been my concern five months ago when I was first uh, looped into this issue, is how you educate a community about the idea that your neighbor might have a cat colony um, that is, you know, uh, permitted by our laws to be feeding um, the, the the cats, potential rodents, the, the concerns we heard from the residents in Maplewood who went and spoke to understand the education behind it. So, um, so the important thing to remember, probably with almost any question that somebody comes up with about, well, how would this work? The thing to remember is that what you're comparing it to is the current situation where you have a lot of cats and colonies that are uncontrolled and, and reproducing. And you're not comparing it to a situation where there are no cats. Um, so the question of how do you explain to a neighbor that, they're, that they're, their neighbor has a colony that's permitted to be there Right now, the cats are there. The only thing that trap neuter return would change is that the cats would be um, sterilized and vaccinated, and there would be no more kittens, and some of them are probably tame, would be removed, so there would be fewer cats. Most of the nuisance behaviors that people report are mating-related behaviors from unneutered cats, mostly the males. Most of the complaints that, um, that there are about cats are cats are urinating, um, or depositing feces on somebody's property. It's not cats urinating. When cats urinate outside, you can't tell where a cat's urinated. What people are actually complaining about is male cats that are spraying to mark their territory, and it is an extremely strong smell, and they purposefully mark. Um, cats bury their feces, except for unneutered males who are marking their territory. People complain about noise and yowling and fighting. That's mating behavior. They complain about kittens, and, and that's also you know, reproduction um, numbers. Cats stop roaming as much. They stop creating a lot of these nuisances when they're neutered. Usually, if you talk to a neighbor and explain what's going on, what's going to be done, that the numbers are going to go down, most of these behaviors will stop, and that the alternative is removing the cats, the cats get killed, and then cats from the next block move in who aren't neutered, and the whole thing starts over. People are usually really interested in cooperating with this. There are also, um, there's something called nuisance abatement when there's a full TNR ordinance. It's pretty much always <coughs> included, which means that nuisance complaints usually go down to almost zero when there's been trap neuter return. But if there is a complaint about um, a trap neuter returned cat, such as one that is, this is one of the things that may still happen, a cat is um, going and digging in somebody's garden and using it as a litter box or something like that. There are deterrent devices. There needs to be somebody who can go out and talk to the neighbor and provide a deterrent device. There are, um, there's a motion activated sprinkler that costs $60 that's very effective in training cats to stay off of a property. There are little plastic mats with prongs that you can bury in the garden so that cats don't want to dig there. Um, and they, and they stop using it. So. In general, people, towns report that there are so many fewer nuisance complaints and that the ones that exist are easier to resolve once there's been trap neuter return. Did you do, just a follow-up, did you do in Maplewood, for example, was there a mailing, articles, like how, how did you get word out when you, you know, got the township committee support to adopt this program? So I'm, I personally am not involved with the on-the-ground work in any of these towns, except my own. I run a municipal TNR program in Mount Olive. Um, but I'm an attorney, and I'm generally just brought in to assist with um, presentations, structuring a program, ordinance drafting. There's a nonprofit that formed by a group of residents in, in Maplewood that are doing all of that. I don't know exactly what they've been doing. Um, common ways of getting the word out uh, you know, is through newspaper, through word of mouth, um, flyering at events, things like that. I have been in contact with them and they said that, you know, they just started in January. Um, they, they've trapped over 70 cats, which given the temperatures this winter, I'm kind of shocked that they immediately, you know, got off uh, doing that and they've, I think they removed 
about half of them. Um, they said 38 of them they TNR'd. But they said they get, they're getting calls almost every day from people who have been feeding cats for a long time and heard uh, about the program and the ordinance and want their help. So mm -hmm. there's, there's various ways of doing it. There's also People for Animals is, does um, free community workshops if they're brought in by a town so that they can do an event you know, in a, a place like this and put the word out so people can come and ask questions and learn, learn about the program. Are there other qu questions from the trustees? I just just think that um, what uh, Trustee Collum stated in the beginning, that uh, this should be a collaborative um, effort to look at what is best practices and what makes sense. So I would um, uh, look forward to um, seeing this group um, uh, uh, meet with the, uh, the Board of Health because they're the ones who are ultimately responsible for uh, uh, the animal health or the animal programs uh, in the town and I, w I think this shouldn't be delayed I think it should be at the next meeting um, it should be there seems to be a sense of urgency and we should respect that and this is something that should be done together looking at the best approach so my suggestion is to um, ha have um, them put on the agenda for the next Board of Health meeting, and when would that be? We know that the Board of Health has discussed it in the past. Um, Mr. Festa, did you want yeah, <laughs> yeah, to? Yeah, go to the, the microphone. Next meeting is this Thursday, but that's too quickly. My board president's in Chicago. He had a funeral to attend. So my next meeting after that would be May 21st. Okay, so, so maybe um, it sounds like a good follow-up would be to plan to discuss this at that meeting and perhaps there's a small group of people that could get together beforehand to have a more formal um, or more informal but more interactive conversation about any of these issues. Um, I don't know if there's a trustee uh, liaison um, <coughs> since you're the Board of Health liaison. Um, and I can work with Deborah as well. I'd I've appreciate that. So, so maybe trustee Column, it. trustee Davis mm -hmm. Ford, mm -hmm. um, if there's any group of residents or anybody else anybody else including Mr. Festa obviously if you'd like or anyone from the Board of Health if they'd like to participate maybe that's a more interactive conversation that, that we can have here that can happen before the next Board of Health meeting at which point it will be more formally discussed. Can, can we have a review of the ordinances as well? Yes. Yeah I think that makes sense. Yeah I believe Michelle said sample ordinances are in the packets. You're talking about our own uh, ordinances. Uh, uh, in, in relation to the, these that uh, were provided in the, in the folder. Okay. Okay. okay, so I... And it could be at the legal committee. Yeah, legal coordinator. Yeah, we'll put that on the legal committee, the ordinance. Okay, so we're going to have some discussions of the ordinance the next legal committee. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Fester, did you want to... Well, one other comment from one of the trustees asked if we're enforcing the feeding ban. We are. We just stopped a major feeder on Meadowbrook Lane last year. We subpoenaed eight residents. They testified before the prosecutor and the judge. It's been a pro problem for about 10 years. Now that it has since stopped, that neighborhood is normalizing now. Okay. So we are actively have that in court. We've had for several years now. Thank you. All right, so it sounds like we have some good follow-ups, um, unless there's any more questions or comments this I time. Can, just to get yeah. a pulse of the board, um, is, is the desire right now, again, not voting on anything, because I think some of us got some emails requesting us to support it, but is there enough at least sentiment from the majority of the board that we want to pursue it further um, and move it in these two directions? It appears as is though that, there is. Yeah, I, I so like we to, have that I'd like consensus? I'd, like to make wood as well. I'd also like to hear the health officer's opinion after they had the discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we have the legal committee, and we'll get to hear from our Board of Health at the next two meetings, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to share with I some of the residents that I've been working with those meetings as well so that we can okay. take the information today and, and then and, and I think down. I think the health department uh, the Board of Health would be the one that would pass an ordinance not mm -hmm. us they they have an ordinance now Is I that don't think correct, it falls Mr. Lewis? What? Yeah but it's not our jurisdiction The Board of Health yes. would be the jurisdiction to pass the ordinance mm -hmm. and and you have to get to the my, let him get to the board. Sorry it's just a process question. Yes trustee so yeah, when the Board of Health enacts an ordinance, and I'm sorry, I'm just not the liaison to the Board of Health, um, 
you adopt it and then it's officially made part of our code as a result, or do we codify it as the governing body? No, they are an autonomous board of health. They can adopt, repeal, and make ordinances themselves by statute. Okay, so, so I legally, might draft it, they review it, they read it, they have a second read, and they put it in a paper, they go through the same process that the Board of Trustees would, mm -hmm. okay. but the Board of Health indeed can make their own ordinances. And that's what I understood, and that's why I said we need to, to bring it to the Board of Health and collaboratively ha have this discussion. That works. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, generally, in non Faulkner Act towns, I assume that this is not a Faulkner Act town, right? We're a very unique charter. Not, okay. Yes. It, um, under state law, there's usually concurrent jurisdiction over animal issues between Board of Health and the council. Um, so either body could, could pass an ordinance. Um, I just I want to offer my services if you, I provide other forms of technical support, including assistance with drafting ordinances. I'm sometimes asked to draft or draft an amendment. I, I'm happy to work with the uh, village attorney or to help with brainstorming structures or providing materials from other towns. There are a few sample ordinances in your packet. Because of South Orange's ordinances, I focused on ordinances that have feeding bans with exemptions to trap, neuter, return, and Maplewood's ordinance because it is a sister um, municipality. But there are a lot of other ordinances with different models, and I would be happy to provide to anyone additional ordinances that address other matters. I didn't want to deluge you with paperwork, but I would be happy for anyone to contact me for further information about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming in and for all the information. Okay. Okay, so at this time I would like to open the meeting up for public comments. Um, I don't know if we had probably not a sign-in sheet tonight. Um, just walk up. But if uh, anybody would like to make a public comment at this time, um, just head up to the podium. On anything. Sorry? On anything. Not just on the presentation. Just make right, right. Public comments. This is our general public comment period. So just state your name and address. Um, and if you could try and limit your comments to uh, three minutes, if we can get to everybody, that would be great. Sure, no problem. My name is Mark Ackerson, live at 183 West Fairview Avenue. I'm a member of Seton Village Residents for Positive Change. Uh, our members have been active supporters and remain active supporters of the township and Seton Village efforts to really make a difference and improve the Irvington Avenue corridor. Our group formed when a proposal was brought to the community for development along the corridor that we were shocked by its inappropriateness and felt it was important for us as residents to participate more closely with the corridor's redevelopment. Over the past couple weeks, we have spent our time going back to different committees, introducing ourselves, and discussing various visions for the Seton Village area. I'd like to share a few things we learned at these meetings. First, we learned that everyone is interested in seeing, or everyone we talk to is interested in seeing the corridor improve and be developed. Everyone we talk to is in agreement that Seton Village is not downtown. We learned that it's a growing buzz about the area and people in town are really starting to take interest. We learned there's a growing development pressure in this area, not just Seton Village, but the region, the region at large. We've been reminded that purchasing a home is one of the largest investments a family makes and when making such investment, families look to certain assurities from the local municipalities. Zoning is one tool that these local municipalities use to provide residents of their community with a sense of assurity. We've been reminded that the community has given feedback in this area that's focused on predominantly medium density residents and would like to see an active street life. We've been reminded that the Irvington Avenue corridor is a unique business pocket within a residential neighborhood. The area <coughs> The, and the areas along this corridor that transition into and out of the commercial zone would best serve as buffers to complement the, 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 the business components while protecting the residential characteristics of the surrounding neighborhood. We learn that while market, there is the market demand for rental apartment units in this region, there is actually higher demand for townhouse development. Currently within South Orange, the gateway just opened with only 50% occupancy. Third and Valley will soon be open 
with an additional 215 units coming on the market. 30 seconds. The property at Church and South Avenue, South Orange Avenue, have recently been purchased and likely to be developed soon. Within the region, a larger number of units, 2,000, are currently under construction. The rental market is being addressed. How are we addressing the townhouse market? In June of 2014, the township started to study the corridor in more detail in order to make a more comprehensive plan on how to best revitalize. Step one has been started. This step, as John Vogel put it, we're, we're looking at what is the stage. A survey, as Doug Zucker put it, to figure out what can be done. The town has started the process that needs to be completed. The next step is to determine, again, to quote John, what the area should be. Thank you. Thank you. And just because we don't have the stopwatch up there tonight, um, I'm just gonna, not trying to be rude, but just let folks know they have 30 seconds left and then at the uh, three minute mark. Um, so anybody else, if you'd like to come up, yep, yeah, just come on up. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is David Akins. I live at 163 Scotland Road. And I would like to mention that for the elder people in your audience here, the sound system is not quite loud enough. It would be much nicer if it were a little bit louder. I don't even think some of the, like Mr. Clark's we're microphone is even on. Either. So uh, that makes it very difficult to hear every word and to really participate as we would like. And, so and I think in a town this size, that could be accomplished very easily. Secondly, uh, I met your uh, animal control officer the last time he was here about, I guess, a year ago or so. And we were talking about feral cats. And he said that he had a number at home and that they're very affectionate. And I want to mention, because at that time, a mother cat had brought her two kittens to our house. And so I built a cat house for them. And very surprisingly, one of the cats was extremely intelligent. He walked into the house, he immediately became part of the family. You could tell him when you were going to feed, wait till we put the food out. He would sit down and wait. And in, t in general, feral cats are much more intelligent than domestic cats because they have to learn how to survive in a very difficult area. In fact, wild animals, it is extremely difficult due to com competition. They tend to live for about three years where domestic animals often live easily till 18 years. So I think that the possibility, we've had these cats neutered and spayed, that uh, this is uh, not something that uh, these are completely unsocialized animals. They actually are very <coughs> intelligent and they often can be socialized. But in general, most of them will not be because they've had to become very intelligent and frightened just to survive. But I wanted to mention that there are exceptions to what we're talking about tonight, and this is a very interesting subject. And I noticed that when you say the Pledge of Allegiance here, there's another issue, and that is it's a bit intrusive as to whether a person believes or doesn't believe in God, and it's intrusive as to whether the person thinks the flag should be a symbol for honesty and truth. Because you know this country, up until recently, I was in the first class in California that was integrated with Latin-speaking people, and that was, this type of uh, discrimination <coughs> was legal at the time. I was in the South, and shortly after that, and discrimination against blacks was legal. So I have very little feeling about saluting a flag that is a symbol for what has been, through 400 years, extreme dishonesty. And having spent 15 years in Vietnam, which was fought for money, I can tell you that, uh, and 10 million people killed in the area, I can tell you that this is seconds. something that I cannot in good nature salute. But I can talk about what we need to do for animals. I also would like to mention that something to, that we could talk about another time, that is the old house over here. The old house is maybe one in the whole world that is the last Dutch trading post <coughs> in America. I can't work with the uh, historical society. There's a joke about the historical society. If you want a building <coughs> destroyed, you call up the historical society and you ask them to save it. But this, I'm sure we could get the, uh, the Dutch uh, embassy involved and that something beautiful could be done, maybe like the Melville Auditorium in uh, Long Island. 
So I think those three items are very important. I don't think anybody should be expected to do social uh, pressure to salute a flag or anything at this time in history. All right, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. <coughs> George Matias. Just don't worry it's not about amplified. That's just really okay. The room is not amplified. Okay. There are no speakers in here. That's for broadcast. But everybody should talk like that, <laughs> and then we'll be fine. Uh -huh. Okay. Please don't hold the microphone. George Matias, 219 South Orange Avenue in South Orange. Um, I came up to bring a couple issues. The main issue is the number of blown out lights on the streets in South Orange or the lamp posts are knocked over or missing. I've reported it several times to PSCNG. I've also <clears throat> logged it into South Orange Connect and I get reports saying this job has been completed and some of them have been uncompleted since November or December. I will bring a couple of the locations. In front of 53 South Orange Avenue, there's a base of a pole that needs to be erected because the light is missing since December. Lights are out in the walkway of 113-115 South Orange Avenue, the walkway that leads back of the old city hall at 101 South Orange Avenue. Uh, there's a missing post at 170 Irvington <coughs> Avenue. It's just wires in the ground. Also at 551 South Orange Avenue at the corner of Center Street, there's wires and a metal plate which used to be a light fixture no longer standing since the winter. The light fixture at Grove Park at the little house, I guess, where the East Orange Water Works does work, the light fixture has been blown out for weeks and needs a new one. Also, um, okay, the old city hall, many lights are out in the back. 60 Taylor Street, the parking lot, numerous light fixtures are blown out and missing. PSC and G needs to be notified because I'm calling and it's like, they say they need light post numbers. I can't give them a light post number if the pole is not there anymore. And also, Near the blue plates um, special, when you're crossing the um, crosswalks and on, on West Fairview seconds. Avenue, there are many bricks that are missing. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thanks, George. speak at this time? Okay, um, seeing as there's no more public comments, um, I will close the public comment period um, and attempt to address some of the comments that were made. Uh, <coughs> there was a, a, a comment uh, from a gentleman about um, the uh, townhouse uh, market in South Orange. I think that's something that um, we certainly all agree with. Um, you know, that's something that certainly, you know, I, I, from growing up in South Orange, um, uh, you know, I've certainly noticed it as well. I think there's a lot of folks um, who raise kids here. They have these great, big, beautiful houses. The kids move out, um, and now they have this large house, and there's nowhere to downsize to. Um, and I think that's you know one of the you know the empty nester market. There's a handful of others that you know we've all identified as markets that we definitely do want to capture. Um, so it's definitely part of the thinking. Um, hopefully, that's been discussed at some of the meetings that it sounds like you're attending. 
Um, I would certainly suggest continuing to attend those meetings. Um, the feedback that you brought up tonight is you know, certainly valuable and should be part of those. Um, and um, so I, I think that's the, the kind of best way um, to move forward there. But again, you know, I think that is something that we are definitely all aware of. And certainly thinking about the different areas of South Orange and the different characteristics of where you are, you know, the central business district versus um, a secondary business district versus an area that's neighboring on residential. We're, you know, we're going to be looking at um, doing redevelopment that is going to attempt to best match um, that neighborhood. It's not all going to be the same. Um, and I think townhouse, townhouses, um, personally speaking, and I think I can speak on behalf of everybody, are certainly part of that vision. Um, um, I apologize to the gentleman um, uh, mentioned about the sound system. We don't normally meet in this room, and there is normally amplified sound. Um, so it's just tonight because we happen to be meeting here, which happens once every six or nine months as we have to meet in this room. Um, you know, as far as saluting the flag, um, I think actually one of the beautiful things about that flag is your freedom of speech to not salute it if you want to. Um, I certainly will. Um, and um, again, you know, I think that's one of the incredible things about this country is that we do have um, freedom of speech and that you aren't forced to do that if you don't want to. And there aren't any components of it that um, are legally required of you to, um, to do. Um, so if you'd like to sit that out the next time around, you know, you're certainly, um, certainly free to do that. Um, uh, I don't know if George is still here. Oh, you are here. Okay, thank you. Um, if you could email me uh, any of the, the, the ticket numbers for any of the requests that you've submitted, um, I'll go look in and we'll look at the requests that you've submitted from your email address. Um, but if there are any ones that are outstanding, uh, if you log in there and you can see the like the number of the request of the complaint, if you send those to me, um, I'll make sure to go follow up on those and make sure they get done. PSENG now does get emailed directly when a um, request goes in for a gas lamp outage. Um, that was something that Trustee Levison and some others spent a pretty good deal of time actually setting up so that we don't have to take it and then pass it to them, but they actually get the email as you put it in. But they also only have one or two people for the whole state for fixing one. 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 one, you saw him today. Okay. Was he in South Orange? He was on my street. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so George, just if, if you do me a favor, and if, if you, I'll, I'll look and we'll follow up on those and make sure that um, things are getting followed up on. But if there are any that have, uh, uh, oh, okay, okay, got it. Um, but if, they, yeah, if there's anything of particular note that hasn't been followed up on or something that was completed and it, and it hasn't actually been completed, if you get the number of that and send it to me, I'll go, we'll go follow up and make sure that we figure that out. Um, and to the comment about the open democracy ordinance, uh, I mean, this is a good thing. It's for more transparency. It's to make the information um, that the town has more available to people. Um, so it's not enough yet, even though we are very transparent. Um, I think you know we haven't done enough, which is why we're looking at doing an ordinance um, to actually codify into law um, the best practices that we all do and that we all agree to. Um, so uh, I think there's more to do. Um, we already set a pretty good example, I think, for a town, um, you know, one of the best, if not the best, in New Jersey as far as how responsive we try and be, how much we try and put information out there, um, and what formats we make that information available in. Um, but the purpose of the ordinance is to take all of that write it down, um, in my opinion, put it into law, and make sure that that's followed by anybody that ever comes after us. Um, so that's just a, a quick explanation, which we're going to get into more in a little bit, um, about what that ordinance is. Um, so that, that's my best attempt to address all the um, public comments that were brought up. Um, and uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, see if we can move on to the approval of minutes. Can I just add? Yeah. Um, that's actually two comments. First, thanking um, Mr. Ackerman. Uh, you remember he came and spoke at the last board meeting, so it's that point in time, and some of the things he went over was meeting with the Seat and Village Committee, the Development Committee, and so the process has been very much ongoing, um, and there has been no uh, updates to the Board of Trustees from the administration, who was basically instructed from the community feedback to go back, work with the developer, come up with some alternatives, and then bring it back. And that's um, specific to the Irvington Avenue? Okay. Specific to Irvington Avenue proposal. And the other thing for George, George, we're going to get ready to do the uh, project gas light again and send out the volunteers. You do a great job, but if we it, we're like at our year anniversary to send out everybody again and try and document all the ones throughout town, so you'll be hearing about that soon, and I'm sure you'll be back. I think you need about 20 or 25 volunteers to match how active George is. and We probably need more <laughs> than 25 volunteers to match a George, so yeah. thank you, George. Um, okay, so let's move on to the uh, approval of minutes. 
Um, we've got uh, executive session minutes from February 9th and February 23rd. I'll move. I'll move. Moved by Trustee Levison, Second. seconded by Trustee Schnall. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, and e executive session minutes from uh, March 9th and March 23rd. Move. Moved by Trustee Reisner, seconded by Trustee Schnall. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's move on to ordinances for first reading. Ordinance 2015-06, an introduction of an ordinance to require that government records and information be made available in transparent and accessible formats and setting other open government and privacy provisions. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so this was uh, tabled from our last meeting pending a discussion of the legal committee, which we had. Um, Trustee Davis Ford, as the chair of the legal committee, um, was there anything that you wanted to, I know there was some, would you like to summarize or? Um, I, would you like me to do it now or after you um, go through it? No, you, yeah, you can. All right. Well, we had a, um, a robust discussion in legal committee about uh, the ordinance for, uh, I guess you call it open documents or open government or I, open whatever. And <laughs> and what we've decided that the initiatives are, are, are something that we really admire and support. As a matter of fact, many of those activities uh, pointed out in the ordinance we do now as a matter of policy um, and, all, and as a matter of state statute. For example, if someone requests information that is public, part of our public dockets, we are required by the New Jersey state statute known as the OPRA um, uh, Act to respond quarterly and to provide all information that we have that's on hand. We post a lot of things now on our agenda, you know, our uh, many records, budgets, uh, just a ton of information that uh, a resident or, in, or a non-resident doesn't have to ask us for that information. They can go right to the site and capture that information. So, um, uh, Mr. President, I really admire you, you, this initiative uh, and the recommendation out of the legal committee is that we, we should um, approach this in a different form um, since it's already a matter of policy and um, also we un comply to the state ordinance and the way that we should do this if we do move forward in any form is by the way of a resolution as opposed to an ordinance. Uh, and, and the other thing uh, that we, we believed out after reviewing our discussion, that the, the, the time frame to have an ordinance such as this, um, we need a lot more time to look at uh, certain aspects of it because it just generated additional uh, questions. And, uh, and the ordinance um, just is just not the way to go. And that is the recommendation of the legal uh, committee is that if we do move forward in any way on what you're requesting, it should be in the form of a resolution and not a, a, in the form of an ordinance. Thank you. Um, so I think um, we can speak to that. Just to also to clarify, that was uh, yourself and Trustee Levison and, that were at the yes, meeting. And I discussed and, it with trustee, a member, sitting member, uh, uh, trustee Column and she agreed with our recommendation. Okay, although she wasn't there for any of the discussion. No. Okay, and, and Trustee Levison, I know you had some comments that I believe um, we've addressed all of them, but before before we dive into that, one of the things I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, kind of a little back to basics here, is the difference between an ordinance and a resolution. Um, and when talking about this, I was hoping that Mr. Lewis could um, speak to, in your professional experience, in the past of what types of things go into resolutions versus what types of things go into ordinances and for something such as this um, you know whether we've obviously had a lot of discussions um, about this and we put this into an ordinance for reasons that it seemed most appropriate so I just wanted um, with someone with certainly more professional experience in municipal government than, than myself or most of us if you could maybe weigh in briefly 
Uh, yeah, Mr. President, and um, certainly conceptually the difference, in, and Mr. Uh, Rother, I'm sure, could weigh in as well. Uh, there is clearly a difference between an ordinance and a resolution, uh, generally in my experience, and I think legally. Um, ordinances are intended to be more permanent. They get codified. They get put in, in the code book. Uh, resolutions are more typically either uh, sort of momentary approvals of a particular contract, an agreement, uh, adopting uh, something uh, or of, of some limited duration. Um, again, this particular topic, uh, you know, in, in terms of, I, I gather the one suggestion would be to uh, essentially take what is in the ordinance form and adopt that by resolution, adopt that as a policy. Um, you know, I, I think the, the question would be what, what is the intent of, uh, you know, if, if you're going to act on that without, you know, opining or, or commenting on the, on the substance of it, but just generally, um, you know, what is the intent of what you want to do? And if the intent is that it should be, you know, permanent part of your law, so to speak, then, then certainly an ordinance would be the, the more typical way to handle it. Um, I don't know if Mr. Rother, do you have anything to add or is that well, resolution versus ordinance? I, I, in my experience, policy statements are more typically adopted via ordinance rather than uh, via resolution rather than ordinance. Uh, or, ordinance carries with it, you know, the immutable force of law going forward as opposed to a policy statement mm -hmm. that has some ability to live and breathe uh, as, my as, you, as you move along. Steve? Uh, so Speak up a little. Or no, I think that yeah. I'm not speaking into the, into the mic. Um, so that, that I, I think that is, is the distinction that has been discussed. Uh, do we want, do we want a, a rigid statement of what is required versus an adoption of a policy uh, that will be uh, pursued? And I think that's, that's, that's the distinction here. So w one of the things that's also worth clarifying, I think, is that um, for, uh, for the most part, actually, none of the things that we do, like posting things on the website, um, there are actually no policies about any of this. Um, there's no laws, there's no policies, there's nothing, um, which is the purpose of putting this together into an <coughs> ordinance form. Um, so, you know, ideally, you would have a governing body comprised of people like us that are interested in doing these things, but we can't ever guarantee that in the future. Um, and that's kind of how, uh, by passing laws, it's how governments... Um, make themselves work better, right? Um, and there's the, the state statute that regulates open public meetings and open public records is a law. Um, if, it was, if it had been a, um, you know, a, a, res a joint resolution of the state legislature, I don't imagine elected officials anywhere would follow it. Uh, people barely follow the Open Public Meetings Act and Open Public Records Act as it is, and those are laws that come with actual legal accountability. Um, so had they been a resolution, I, I would imagine they'd be completely... Um, not followed at all. Um, so, you know, I did a fair amount of research, um, you know, in this field and met with um, several other elected officials and several organizations, including organizations like the Sunlight Foundation, which is the largest open government organization in the entire country, um, and got a lot of ideas about how to do this. So, I don't know, Trustee Davis Ford, um, if there were there examples of towns that had done this by resolution that you had seen that made you think that this was the best way to approach it? No. Um, the, my uh, uh, thoughts on for it to be uh, a resolution as opposed to an ordinance is that um, we are already doing a lot of these things. Um, this uh, ordinance seems to be uh, very, very uh, arduous. <laughs> um, there are parts of it that still has a lot of questions and clarity that needs to be vetted. Even if we do go the ordinance route, um, it's not ready. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, we addressed all the questions in the legal committee. So if there are any outstanding questions, what, what were they? Um, and then um, the other reason why uh, I would prefer a resolution, because it's a matter of policy. I don't think that there is any need to create an a, a ordinance uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, of creating an ordinance when we do so many of these things now. We do a lot of it now, and I would prefer 
that um, that it would be in the form of a a resolution because it just is another way to affirm uh, some of the initiatives that you talked about and as a way to affirm a policy that we we all embrace and in many ways many of the things uh, that uh, you desire in this ordinance we do but and 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 we uh, when you talk about other towns or other areas that may or may not apply to the state statute, the Open Public Records Act, meaning on a timely basis um, responding to re requests for information. Well, I can't really speak to other towns. I don't know that, but I can talk about South Orange. We're very, very responsive. Um, uh, we And those responsibilities generally come through the clerk's office, and our clerk's office uh, our clerk and our deputy clerk are exceptional in uh, uh, responding and working with our legal counsel. There's no information that is that is requested by a resident or anyone that is not responded to, responded in within the time frame. I believe it is five or seven business days unless it re involves research. So if someone can get a lot of their questions are asked without even an open request by going on, on, on our website, or if someone can put in an open request and get the response from us, which they do, and we have documentation that we do, this is documented, that, that, that the responses are met, um, you know, if it's accessible within the same day, one day, two days, but always by the time that's required by statute. Um, so I, I think an important point is that you you know you mentioned for example putting things on the website. We're not legally we're not required to do that right now. Right. right? We do that because we think it's a good idea. The people who happen to be sitting here, yes. we will not always be sitting here. Right. It's a point of passing laws is so that people after you have to do what you think is a good idea. So that is how all progress is made in a society is by a government taking an idea, taking a set of best practices and putting them into law. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, right. seatbelt laws. Car safety, I mean, you can go on and on the list of things that were put in legislation. Had the government expressed an, uh, a desire to see those things done by passing a resolution, none of them would ever have been done. Um, and so, you know, the idea of, of passing the law is actually in direct response to the fact that we do it well. So we should use that right now and say, well, we do a good job. We agree to do these things. So let's make sure it's formal and codified. But what's kind of confusing to me, I guess, is that if we already do a good job and we don't need an ordinance, then why would you suggest doing a resolution? What would that accomplish? Um, because out of um, recognizing that the desire to let people know that we value being open and transparent, um, I believe that it, 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 it's a way to acknowledge that. So it's without, just saying it, it's not actually doing Can I doing finish? It. May I finish, sure. please? Without um, um, putting together an ordinance that's not ready. Also, well, I'm sorry, what wasn't ready about it? Okay, um, let, just let me finish my thought, please, um, um, because I'll get distracted. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, even though ordinance can be changed, so even if we put it down, you know, a new body can come and change it, the thought of putting down what we believe is correct right now so that we hold people who come um, behind us. Um, doesn't really resonate with me. Why should why should we, as an existing body, put something in place because we believe it is absolutely right? Um, when uh, things change, dynamics change, all sorts of things change. So you know, the, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, that because we pass it because we believe it's right that we need to do it as a form of an ordinance. You know. So you wouldn't be in favor of the Open Public Meetings Act and Open Public Records Act existing in state law? I didn't say that. Because those were, that was a time when the legislature said, well, we believe these are the right things to do right. to make government more transparent. They passed those laws. It made government more transparent. Why shouldn't we do the same thing? Because I don't think it's necessary because of what I just stated. Because of the things, because we're so transparent. Because we just informally happen to do it. We don't need to make a law about it. It's not informal. It, it is 100% informal, right? That has to be understood. There, it's informal because there are no policies and there are no laws. Nothing exists that requires that we do any of the, the way that we operate transparently 
is just because we happen to do it that way. It is totally informal. You know, I have a lot of respect for the time and your thoughts behind it and initiatives. I really do. And you've put a lot of work into it. And I guess what it's going to boil down to is we're, we just choose to disagree about what is needed at this time in our approach. Yeah, I, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand your points a little bit better, especially the part about the ordinance not being ready. Um, so were there things that you wanted to talk about? Were there questions? Because I remember sitting in a legal committee um, and we went through and answered every question and I had asked, did we address all the questions? And the only outstanding question was a question that Trustee Levison had, which was the time it would take to implement this and we changed the number of days from 60 days to 120 days um, to mitigate that. So, you know, we did, we did sit in a legal committee and discuss this and uh, we did all agree that it, it was complete. So I'm just unaware of any questions that still exist or why it wouldn't be ready. Because we also spent several months not only did I spend several months working on it with other organizations and elected officials, we spent mm -hmm. several months, myself, our attorneys, the administrator, and the clerk working on it. Um, so I'm not, and it's based on best practices that already exist in many other places. So I, you know, I guess my questions would be what, you know, could you bullet out the questions that you still have? I just believe that there should be another, a different approach than the approach that I, you, you Okay, choose. so it's not that it's so, incomplete, it's just, a Would approach. you like to weigh in, yeah. uh, I, I Trustee Levison, because you <coughs> agreed think, with my recommendation? Yeah. I think there were two issues, that, at least that I had. One is that, similar to uh, Trustee Davis Ford, I don't think it requires an ordinance. I think uh, uh, resolutions would be the preferable way of doing it, uh, given that it's it basically is policy and procedure that we're looking at. These are structures that may, we may not have in place. Our intent is to have those structures, and I agree with the intent of having those structures, we need to write policies and procedures for it. And I think they get enacted through resolutions, as uh, Steve had indicated uh, before. The other, uh, and I express it as, is that I think what we have is the cart before the horse. Um, I think we need to define the structures and how to go about implementing the various components that you have listed in uh, currently in the ordinance. Uh, we don't have those things. I don't believe on the short term we will be able to implement even if it was 120 days. Um, I'm not aware of all of the software required that, that uh, needs to be done and that internally that we have those structures in place to implement that today. And I would like to see that done before we implement something like this. The ordinance from a, from a a view of the ordin of this uh, ordinance structure is it's an internal practice. It doesn't have to do with people on the outside. It's something that we are going to structure within our own departments so that people on the outside can use the information. What will happen or who will violate this ordinance or the law? People internally, what are you going to find the staff if they don't proceed? It is, it is a structure where uh, we should have policies and procedures, and people get uh, evaluated based upon how they perform against those policies and procedures. And they can, over time, as, as uh, Trustee Davis Ford indicated, over time, we can modify those as things change. There are, pra there are software practices that will change, and there are implementations <coughs> that we're in the process of putting together, which we haven't done yet. So just two, two quick things. Um, one is that from, from uh, the standpoint of the project planning, right, that's something that we've never done before passing any ordinance or resolution ever that we've ever been here. So you know, I, I, I appreciate your interest in um, wanting to have a plan. Um, you've never put it in place for anything that you've brought here to the board. Um, and what I, we I did- would, I disagree with that. What, with what that. we did in this ordinance was instead of leaving it open-ended, which is what every other ordinance that we've adopted, okay. introduced and okay. adopted has been, we actually included a stipulation, a requirement that a project plan be created, which we had never done before. And if it doesn't? And if the sun doesn't, I mean, if, I mean, if anything doesn't anything, you know, is a very easy yeah. way to make it sound like things are more uncertain than they are. We have an extremely competent administration. We have an extremely competent staff. I have no doubt, because I've been discussing it with them for several months, that this would all be implemented very easily. We looked at the software platforms that existed. We have those conversations. We don't have to purchase anything else. We almost don't have to change. We have to change very little of what we're doing to do this, because most of what's in here, we actually already do. Can I have a question for- we do. 
Is that definable? Is it something that you could write down and say this is the process that we're using? Uh, yeah, and that would be yeah, absolutely, and that would be done. We, I mean, you wouldn't create a project plan for something that you're not doing. You would say, well, we're going to do this, and then you pass the ordinance, and now it is up to the administration to implement the ordinance. And in doing that, we've actually created a legal stipulation that they create that project plan. So I have a question. Can we, can we what happens if um, there there is a lack of compliance? What is the what is the penalty? Well, as I mentioned to you when, you when you asked that in the legal committee, there's a general penalty clause in our code, which is a fine for 1000 or $1,200. Would that be enforced like that, lickety split? I doubt it because I don't think any village code is enforced like that. There's always discretion about how things are. I mean, we just kind of had part of that conversation okay. just earlier. Um, but there's a general penalty. It's, the, it's one of the first clauses in the village code. Um, and the whole point of doing this by ordinance is that we should be held that accountable, right? Government transparency is not a choice. It's not a, well, we like to be transparent. This is, in my opinion, a requirement. Um, and so, you know, we can, um, and I'm happy to entertain some more questions too, but, um, you know, as far as that, there should be a penalty. We should be penalized. We should get in trouble if we're not doing things transparently. It shouldn't just be something that we're allowed to ignore because by resolution there is no accountability. There is no teeth to that. There's no regulation. Right, the same way that if the Open Public Meetings Act that, and the Open Public Records Act, which you mentioned as being great examples of things, which are law, they do have penalties. Elected officials get fined for violating that law, as they should. If, so, if an elected official is conducting you know, official business in their, in, in their non-municipal email account, and if they're having public meetings by email, they should absolutely get fined, and the actions that they take and what, what the state statute says become null and void. Let me and play devil's advocate the then. The so if, if all of these uh, 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 laws and statutes uh, exist now, why, why, why are we... They don't exist now. And so, I mean, if so you like... So you just stated it. So I'm... Con I so, need some so, clarity. Yeah, sure. So why, why should we... Cr because what we're putting in this ordinance does not exist, and we, we talked about that too, right? I mean, you mentioned the Open Public Meetings Act, so I just use that as an example to relate mm -hmm. to you. But the Open Public Records Act, for example, I would say is very far behind, right? The state of New Jersey is not a state that is known for government transparency. Um, and there are many other places around the country, which I can mention, who have done a better job than New Jersey has. I think that it's incumbent on us as a town that is more transparent to set the legal example. The state of New Jersey should take after our example, right? They require, part of the problem is that they require the storage of documents, right, in a format that ensures that the integrity of the document, um, so let's say you store an electronic record, right, and 20 years later you go to pull that electronic record out like you're opening a filing cabinet, right, and that record, you have to have a 100% guarantee that that record has not been modified or manipulated in that time frame. Right, and that's a great thing as far as the goal of ensuring that records that are stored are not manipulated when you go to take them in the future. Unfortunately, many of the services, many things that we all use today and take for granted, for example, um, Google Maps transit directions, right, that's a great example of a municipal government in California that decided, well, it doesn't matter what the state requires we store this information in, right? They own the subway systems. Mm -hmm. They own the bus schedules. They don't have to do anything with it, but they decided to do something with it, and they talked, they met with people, as I did right here, they met with people, technologists, and they said, well, so what? You want access to this information. What are you going to do with it? It's like, I don't know what we're going to do with it, but if you provide it in an open data format, in a machine-readable format, we could do really cool stuff with it. And the municipal government said, okay, sure, well, there's no harm to us to provide the information in a new format. Just because the state doesn't require it to be in that format, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't provide it in that format. And in doing so, now if you go on your phone almost anywhere in the country, you have access to public transit directions. And this chief information officer of Madison, Wisconsin, said it really well. These are data, this is paid for by public tax dollars. They have a right to this information. It's not about us and our like, okay, well, we put it in our vault and file cabinet. Now we know that our file's there. They have a right to have this information. They have a right to have the information. It's their information. It is public information. And they need to have it in a format that allows them to do things with it. 
that we can't do storing it in just only the format that doesn't allow you to manipulate it. So for example, with the budget, we have to file and store our budget documents in a particular format, but we also made a spreadsheet of the budget available online, and we can see how many hundreds of residents have gone onto the website, used, downloaded that spreadsheet, and now they can plug in their own numbers, and that data being available in that open format, in a machine-readable format, now allows us to have this great budget tool where you can look at five years of budget data and compare everything in a visualized way. Right? You can't do that unless you make the data available in particular machine-readable formats. That's what this ordinance does. So it takes the information that's owned by the taxpayers, and instead of just saying, well, the state requires that we store it in this format that nobody can touch, nobody can do anything with, and there's no possible private sector innovation, and no one will ever see this information until you come file an Open Public Records Act request and use our staff's time to come and get it. Instead of that, we're going to take the information, we're going to store it the same way that we normally store it, because that's what the state requires us to do, but we're going to go a step further. Right? We're going to go a step further, and we're going to take the information, we're going to meet with people who know more about this than we do, and we're going to ask them for advice. They gave us advice. They gave us the recommendations. They gave us the best practices based on what dozens of other forward-thinking towns, counties, and states around the country have done, and what we have is an ordinance that reflects that. And so it makes the information more available to people. It requires that we post it on the website so that someone can't say, oh, sorry, well, we didn't get around to posting the thing to the website this week. No, you are legally bound to do that. And it should be, we should all be legally bound to do these things and to discharge all of these operations in the most transparent way possible. And so if we want to pass a resolution and say that we're transparent, you know what, there are certainly worse things in the world than that but it is the weaker of the two options, right? The ordinance is the stronger option. It has accountability. It has legal regulation and teeth, whereas a resolution does not. Mr. President? Yeah. So first of all, I want to applaud your leadership on this and, and your idealism uh, on, and, and what you're saying, I think, is um, actually very favorable. Um, my only question is, and I would support it, uh, my question is, as you say, talk, talking about going to the next step is, and I'd like to ask, I hate to put the clerk and the village administrator and perhaps even our, our village council on the spot, but I'd like to hear how much of an onus, how much work effort, uh, given that it is just a matter of balance and trade-offs, uh, that we, we do have a very, very competent and excellent staff, but it does require labor. Uh, and I just want to make sure it wouldn't detract from other priorities. So I, I uh, do appreciate this, and I think it's a great idea. I think the teeth is important when you're trying to make a difference, so I applaud that, but I would like to hear from the others in terms of is this something we can afford to do? Sure. I mean, we certainly discussed that, but I think it would be certainly fair to hear from them, and maybe Mr. Mr. Lewis, if you want to start. Okay. Uh, or Mr. Well, Rother. I'll start only from my perspective. Yeah, there will be a considerable amount of extra work. <coughs> Um, so let, let me point to the one that, that would deal with me. Uh, an open request would require a cover letter and an index of documents. Um, we have had open requests with <coughs> literally hundreds, maybe in some cases almost thousands of documents that we've looked at. And uh, it's one thing to comb through the documents, but then to create an index of them would take a fair amount of time. And that's that's from my perspective. Uh, you know, there are other aspects of it, but from my involvement, that would require a fair amount of time. <coughs> Is that Mr. Lewis? Yeah. Um, and I, I obviously am somewhat from a different perspective because I am not the one charged with compiling the documents or the index or actually putting together a response. So on those, I would defer to uh, village council and the clerk um, as it relates to, and that was certainly one of my concerns uh, when the village president sort of first broached this ordinance was making sure we had adequate time to kind of make sure we were in a position to produce these documents in the formats required uh, in response to which the ordinance says, as he has presented it uh, contains phase and periods of a year and, and I believe two years. Um, 
and, and to some degree that coincides with. So strictly as it relates, and again, there are multiple components of this uh, ordinance, but I, the focus appears to be on the document uh, machine readable, not the answering questions at meetings and some of the other things. So, um, you know, that is, it somewhat coincides with, and, and I do believe that a number of the new products that we are rolling out, the laser fish, uh, the new upgrade, um, that ultimately the vast majority of the documents that we do are going to be in a format that would be compliant with the ordinance, uh, and, and certainly within the year or two, I think that can be done. Uh, again, as it relates to Mr. Rother's concerns, that's not something that I'm responsible for, uh, so it, it isn't something that I'd given thought to, and, and certainly uh, as far as what the clerk's role uh, with respect to you know, how do you handle the request and find out what format, you know, do we tell them what format they're in, do they ask for it, that I would again defer to the clerk. But in terms of the um, having documents in, in the format, um, I, I think with, with the new products that, that within the periods of time allowed in the ordinance that we, we could be in that position to do so. My concern right now is we're understaffed. I just had someone leave in my department and it's really going to put us under the gun as far as doing our day-to-day -day operations and then have this on top of it. Well, this wouldn't put you under the gun because this is a one- and two-year implementation, so you're going to okay. hire this person very soon. Well, I hope so. That's so. Not, right. Yeah, that was my only concern. Sure. Can Trust that Colin? answer your question, Steve? Okay, so um, <coughs> I think there's a few things that we heard, common themes, is that... Um, and, and to the point that a resident raised earlier, this I don't think this is your agenda. I think this is the board's agenda. We mm -hmm. like the tenants. Um, if you go back several governments, all the way back to um, Village President Bill Calabrese, who started implementing some of these things through Doug Newman, everybody's added on. So even through the transitions in boards, um, I think in South Orange we've only improved, and perhaps a lot more um, during Village President Thorpe's term in making things more accessible. The question is the mechanism. And that's why, after talking to both Deborah and Howard, is like, what's the vehicle that we use? And from the discussion we had at the first meeting when this was first introduced was, you know, um, our ordinances are very serious. There's penalties when we look at our line of sight proposal or banning parking or, uh, I mean, if you look at our code, these are very substantive things. I think this is stronger than a resolution. Um, I don't think it's a proclamation. I, I, I do like the idea of adopting it as a policy. I think we've been pretty good at when we create a policy or we at least consent to a policy, sometimes we don't even codify it, we generally follow through on those things. But as a policy, it also gives us flexibility that um, when our staff and they're continuously prioritizing things that come up, when if they can't update a voting record because a significant OPA request came in, that they're able to use their own um, kind of judgment as to what the most pressing need is without being in violation of an ordinance. Um, and so I would, I know we've kind of gone back and forth. I, I much like Trustee Schnall commend the village president on this. I, I do think that more governments, if they followed what we did here, would serve their community a lot better. But I think at this point we could probably do a straw poll and we've had some good debate and see where um, the board wants to move forward and I would accept the legal and personnel committee's recommendation <laughs> that we move forward with a resolution but the caveat adopting a policy not just as a resolution. So were there any other questions or comments? I do, I do have some more specific to the text uh, questions. Uh, I will say that I'm, I'm in the, the vote with Steve Schnall uh, as far as uh, I commend you on your leadership on this. I think uh, moving towards greater transparency is a good thing. Um, I do have some personal reservations with some of these things which I uh, can nitpick and I frankly want to get your opinion on them and what your intention was. Um, in general, I have to say to me this feels more like a resolution, which I know is a weird, uh, you know, to introduce feeling into this. Um, I, I would be a little bit nervous about making some of these things an ordinance in the fact that I would expect ordinances to be um, followed through on. And some of them, I have to admit, I'm not really entirely sure on 
how you would follow through on them and whether or not you should. Um, so I, I do have some, some nitpick things, uh, one of which I believe you uh, addressed earlier, uh, and that was, I guess, to jump in in, in paragraph four of the, the first section. Uh, just making a, a distinction between machine-readable formats um, and the fact that a permanent, unchanged record will not be lost in so doing. Um, just because it uh, initially occurred to me that we need to have some permanent record that cannot be changed, cannot be manipulated in any way, that does remain the, the document of what what happened, what passed, etc. So I believe you addressed that earlier, and that uh, those there can be two separate things, and it's not going to be. Uh, hopefully, that's no additional work in terms of the administrative staff's um, ability to create those two different uh, sets of documentation. Um, uh, when I looked at uh, section three, that the provisions. Uh, the very first one, uh, within two years of adoption of the ordinance, uh, can we actually pull that off within two years? Um, I haven't been privy to the uh, the discussions of the uh, the legal committee on this, but uh, I would be concerned about, frankly, whether or not we have the staff and whether or not we have the ability at this point to make that happen. I know we had some trouble with some execution of uh, some other software and um, electronic digital related things and I'd be uh, concerned about uh, committing to that time frame without having frankly a better sense of whether or not we can do that to begin with. Um, in terms of the making records uh, accessible to the public, um, I would presume that if we're going to make greater um, efforts to make pretty much all of the records uh, available to the public. We would also need to probably write new boilerplate language in the same way we put onto emails that uh, basically anytime you're interacting on this email account, it's public. Uh, and I think we would probably need to do that um, thinking forward to the fact that the transfer of and communication, I'm Hopefully, the transfer and communication <coughs> in future years will become easier and will probably become more varied um, than even now, and that uh, we would need to think in terms of you know technologies that we don't necessarily know existing yet. Um, <coughs> some kind of boilerplate, hey citizen, if you're interacting with with us, then it's all it's all public. Well, That's only if a record is created. Only if the record is created. Well, yeah. well this kind of gets to. Uh, but that's not us. That's that's the open public record. Yeah, side. yeah. That that gets to a question I have uh, kind of further down here, um, and that is uh, one of the areas I was concerned about was. Let me make sure I reference the appropriate section. Um, so I'm in uh, the section three, the provision section, um, and jumping down there appears to be two number twos, but. Uh, nothing in this ordinance shall be deemed to prohibit the township of South Orange Village, its officers, commissions, or Can you speak commi up? I can't. commissions, agencies, or other authorities from voluntarily posting mm -hmm. on the municipal website in machine readable format any government records, regardless of date of creation or of any other circumstances. Um, that one made me a little nervous, um, primarily because. I thought, well, number one, that it sounds like it's kind of opening up the, um, I guess my question is, how do we define then government record? Because if I happen to have an opinion and I feel like I'm just going to throw it out there on the, uh, the government website, um, that's not necessarily shared by you or Sheena or Deborah or any of, so. Ha um, it's defined by state statute. We took okay. a definition right from the state statute. Um, so it's the it's the same definition plus the word video because they didn't include that for some reason. Another example of why we need to do better in the state. Um, but uh, so the definitions for government records are all are defined in that section and are are the it's the same thing that would be um, identified as 
government record under the Open Public Records Act currently, plus video. Um, where is the definition of government records? Uh, it's, in the, it's in the beginning. Um, government record means any paper, written, or printed book, document, drawing, map, plan, photograph, microfilm. So have microfilm, but not video. Data processed or image processed document, information okay. stored or maintained electronically or by yeah, sound and video similar. recording or in a similar that's device or any state copy state. thereof mm -hmm. that has been made, maintained, or kept on file in the course of any official business by any officer, agency, or authority of the township of South Orange. With, with one exception, though, this ordinance creates new government records. Um, no. Yeah, no, no, it no, it doesn't. Does. Not, not, not with capital G, capital R, it does not. No, no, no it does. It does. How so? Because, for instance, the, the index that you require <coughs> me to create when we answer an open record is now a government record by reason of the definition. Sure, sure. So there's a cover page. But that, but that normally wouldn't be a government record but for this ordinance. Well, uh, it, would, it would be, if, I mean, it, it's a government record if you make it a government record. No, because, I mean, if you, because if you, if you, you mandate that it be done and maintained, that by definition then becomes a government But I mean, if you responded to an OPA request and you provided a cover sheet, that would be a government record. No, the fact that you require it to be maintained makes it a government record. So if you responded to an OPA request and you included a cover sheet and other information that was official government information that the clerk provided as a records custodian to a member of the public, in response to an Open Public Records Act request, and another member of the public wanted to see that information, they would not be allowed to because by OPRA, they would not be required to no, give that record no, over because it's not a record. No, stop. The, the, the definition, as you have mimicked it in this ordinance, is that any record that we maintain is a normal record routine. Right. And we have not in the past had an index of OPA requests, you now have made that a requirement, and it therefore has become a new. Sure, you're not changing record. the definition, but you're you added a theoretically you added a record to that. Yep. You Pro a, proactively, even well, though that's, you that did was it, my comment. My it, comment was that this ordinance creates new government records. <laughs> um, yeah, but also just doing it would create new government records. Um, so this is just a proactive. I mean, sure. But they're, they're both the same. Um, Trustee Clark, um, in response, uh, the, basically what that stipulation is saying is that here are the things that are required to be done. But if there was someone, if the governing body said, well, we want to put, you know, X document online, this wouldn't, this is not limiting what you could put online. So that's, this is just that's requiring the what you put online, and the rest would be able to be done if the governing body chose to do so. So that, that, that's what that provision was. Okay. Um, so then the definition of government docu documents, whether they're voluntary or not, if I'm willing to volunteer drafts of, um, drafts of an ordinance or a resolution um, you know, prior to what was agreed to by the board, can I voluntarily? If, if the subject? entire board, if the board approves it, but, but, but drafts aren't part of that to begin with. Drafts are a work in process. Right, right. So right. They're not, that's not you couldn't individually make that decision, but the whole group, if they decided, well, we never finished this thing, and it's a draft, but we want people to see it, the board could say, this says the board could vote and say this now is a public document. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess one of the other issues, I was, uh, there, there was the, uh, which I think I brought up at the last meeting, was the uh, the response to uh, to public input, which again I think it's a it's a valid thing. I it just I'm not sure how you actually define an, a a response uh, to public input, and um, is that simply saying yeah? Um, or I can also see the other side of it. I can frankly see where if, uh, where you could kind of hack the system uh, if you were the public and, for instance, didn't like a certain public official, you could basically sort of send as many public comments their way as possible to <coughs> create a situation where they're forced <coughs> to respond to each and every one of them. And if they have to do that, 
mm. on an individual basis, mm -hmm. it could become very difficult for you to carry out your career. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, it's already difficult. Yes. Um, no, so so we, we did address that in the legal committee, um, which was basically that, um, you know, the, the response could be as much as thank you for your comment. Right, this isn't this isn't requiring any type of response, but right now, um, and for anybody who's watching this for the first time, right, we're not required to respond at all. So the comments about the American flag or the sound or about um, the ordinance, right, we're not required. We're we're required to do a public comment period, and there are many many municipal governments where they do the comment period, then you sit down and they move on with the business, and nothing is addressed, right. And so what this was saying is, well, there should you should be required to respond. <laughs> at the very least. And that sets the tone as saying, well, we are a governing body that wants to address the things that people say. Um, and so that is something um, that's important to do. And it's, it is, I, think it's, I think it's impossible to further, to further specify what's an appropriate response. Yeah. And so he didn't put reasonable or appropriate or any words like that in there. But basically just, we have to respond to everybody. You can't ignore a member of the public 100% ignore them when they come and speak to you as a public official. You know, That's I one of those pieces that oh, feels sorry. to me like resolution can, rather can than arguments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't throw the whole baby out the bathwater, yeah. but that's, that's a piece where that seems resolution. A couple Just points. One, one thing is that this was clearly discussed at the, at the legal committee. It came away with a recommendation not to, be, not to be brought to the board as an ordinance, yet somehow or another it made it here anyway. Uh, Trustee Calm asked that we do a straw poll to see if we should do this as a resolution or an ordinance and just get our feelings. I have the feeling we could debate several of these points mm -hmm. for several more hours, and uh, we've already been on this for quite some time, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we should move on mm -hmm. uh, about how this is. My own personal feeling, this is more of a policy decision, and policy decisions traditionally in this board have been done by resolution. There are certain parts of it where I could see doing it as an ordinance. Um, but I'm not quite sure we're completely ready for all those parts. Uh, there are other things that I think we need to implement first, as Trustee Levinson said, including the new website, which would uh, address some parts of this. But I, I would like to, uh, I would like to do the straw polls, Trustee Calm suggested, and see if we want to do this as a resolution and ordinance or not at all, and move on <coughs> for the rest of the meeting. Sure. So before we do the straw poll, I'm going to make a couple comments, um, and uh, and then uh, I'll ask for that. So there's a couple things um, just quickly that's worth mentioning. Um, you know, we're talking about doing this by resolution, um, which is not something that um, is really done. So I just want to make a couple examples. <coughs> Nobody here had any examples of any places that have done this by resolution. Here are just a few examples uh, of places that I looked at when putting this ordinance together that did it by law. San Francisco, Salt Lake City, New York <coughs> City, the state of New York. Um, and by the way, the person who runs that program for the state of New York for the governor uh, is a colleague of mine who spoke at my class at Seton Hall University about how all this began and all the benefits of it. Hawaii, Honolulu, Portland, Minneapolis, Providence, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Madison, Wisconsin, Montgomery County, and strangely, not one single municipal government in New Jersey. All those places that are leaders in open government did it by the law. Most of them started by executive order by the mayor. Um, some started with a resolution. They all did it by law and said, this is how we're going to do this. So there's a couple quotes that I want to read to you. Um, one is from, um, you know, I'll just read one quote, which is from um, the San Diego Open Government um, Commission. Um, and they're, they're the organization that is in charge of um, implementing San Diego's open government law. In many cases, a city's open government policy begins with a city council resolution or executive order from the mayor and is followed by an ordinance. Resolutions tend to be... <coughs> Resolutions tend to be composed primarily of motivations with a small number of vague features. Executive orders also have more motivations than features, but provide a stronger mandate for the city to embark on a process to define and implement an open data policy. For most cities, an ordinance, a change to the city's laws, should be the goal of open data advocacy. It is only when open data policies are translated into ordinances that the policies will, both, will have both the mandate and the longevity that citizens should expect, although some cities can achieve the same permanence with only an executive order. They do not mention resolution, so we can take the straw poll, but everybody should understand here 
resolution again, not the worst thing in the world, not a step backwards by any means, but it is certainly not a step forward in the sense of the way that we consider ourselves to value ourselves as people who are transparent. It's not a best practice. It is not the way that any organizations that advocate on these issues anywhere in the country suggest ending up. They all suggest doing it by executive order in a strong mayor city or by ordinance and make it a law so there's accountability and so there's... <coughs> May I, um, wait, are you finished? Did you have a question? No, I just want to make a statement to what you just read. Sure. So very good points. Um, um, again, we, we celebrate you for this initiative and we do a lot of it and we, we all um, uh, believe in being open and transparent. Um, what you read there, it said it begins as a resolution. And so, you know, coming from the legal and personnel committee, we, we, we want to be able to uh, put in some form uh, these initiatives starting as a resolution. And then if we get to a point at some point in the future, we're not saying that we will never um, uh, look to maybe um, create an ordinance in this area but we want to begin um, with a resolution because many of these policies exist now and as Trustee uh, Levinson said, there are a lot of things that we need to address before we move forward with an ordinance. And so the statement you read said in it earlier that a lot of these <coughs> in, uh, places where an ordinance was put in place started with a resolution. It started as a resolution. This is the beginning. We're not saying no. We're just saying that the mechanism that we want to use or the vehicle um, um, to uh, uh, move forward in, 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 in this matter is by way via a, a resolution. And then we can continue to look at this and look at the ordinance. And if we see that that is indeed the best uh, way to go, um, we, we have no problem with an ordinance. It's, well, just, it's just not now. Sure, I mean... And the, just the other thing that, that is brought up. You I said mean, in a strong sure. mayor uh, council. Well, this, we don't have that. We have a strong council. Well, actually, that's Let, not true. Uh, mayor. Go on. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's actually that's not what the charter says. Okay. Right, I mean, how would you define a strong mayor form of government? Trustee Davis Ford. Um... Like, what's the difference between a strong you, you, mayor? You have a pretty strong village president form of government. You could have done this as, as village president. Thank you, Mr. Rother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and so, um, so there's two things that's worth correcting in that statement. One is that we actually don't have most of the policies done. We have almost no policies in place at all. Right? We do these things, right, but that's different than a policy. Right? We don't actually have policies. And if you have them, if you could point them out to me, I'd love to see them. But 90% of this is actually not in any policy that we have. Number one. Um, number two, this isn't the beginning, right? I began this when I started doing these things, when we changed the way that we vote, when I added a second public comment period, when all, and some of them were built on what former village presidents had done, um, adding the disclaimer to our emails, adding the disclaimer to our social media accounts, asking for the over process to be done in a better way, starting to put the budget online in a machine readable format. Right, those were all things that basically we don't have an executive order provision of our charter, but like Mr. Rother said, we actually have a strong executive form of government. Um, and so I did do those things already. So the time frame is actually, it's problematic to suggest that it's beginning now. Right now is when it should be ended. Right, we began it years ago, like Trustee Collin mentioned, and we accelerated it hugely in the past four years that I've been village president. So this is not the beginning, right? We've already done, we've already passed the council resolution phase, right? And um, in the studies that I've done, which is fairly extensive about the subject, right, what councils do before they take any action that has anything to do with open, right? These are places where they're doing nothing that's, that's transparent, right? They're doing the state minimum required and a new council gets elected and they say, we want to do better, we're going to work on this. Right? That's when the resolution starts. That's when it begins. And then a year or two years later, they say, okay, well, we've been doing things kind of mismatched for a year or two. Now it's time to put it into law. So what I'm saying is that right, there are two pathways to get to the ordinance, executive order or council resolution. We've basically done the executive order way. I've told, and we've even discussed it here and taken straw polls, which were not necessary, but were part of you know, all of our interest in working together. 
Um, and so we've actually already done that, and we're now at the point where it makes sense to do the ordinance. So understanding that you want to do it and some others want to do it by resolution, that's fine, but um, I don't want anyone to be confused um, that may be watching thinking that the time frame is such that we're beginning this now. Right? We've been doing it for three village presidents and a lot under me. It's time to like actually get organized and put this all into a law and hold ourselves accountable. That's the point that we're at now. All right, so we can do a no, straw No, we can ball. absolutely take a straw poll. And just a correction, though. We, we talked about a few things. Is that what, what I brought up earlier was a resolution adopting a policy. So to the extent that it's not a temporary proclamation mm -hmm. or a great event, we honor you, is that it's a resolution adopting a policy, policy. and that policy will be what we use guiding us. Mm -hmm. um, and so sure. that was my, yeah. No, that and, was that's, my... and that's certainly one way to do it. Okay. Can we take um, a straw poll now? Is that, Trustee Clark? Is that different? A resolution adopting a policy, how is it? Yes. It's, it's structured differently. Yes, it's structured. It's structured. So how is it just different? It's structured differently <laughs> means that there is no legal requirement to do it. There isn't any external accountability whatsoever. Yeah. Right? So an internal policy is a organization policing itself. Right? So if you own a corporation and you say, well, our internal policy is going to be that we're going to be very environmentally friendly, Wink, wink, shareholders. Right. right, you can do that, and it's up to your board of your organization to hold yourselves accountable. This is why open government laws, especially, are not done by policy because the people who are supposed to be enforcing the open government laws are the ones who are required to do things under the open government laws. Right, the entire idea of passing something by law. When you're talking about yourselves, when you're talking about our own behaviors, is that there's external accountability, right? And that's why, especially with government, with government behavior, there are it is never done to suggest that elected officials, especially, should be more transparent by policy. I would challenge anybody here to name one example of that, which I'm sure nobody can, because I've not come across it. Um, and I'm sure it exists somewhere, but it is not the way that it's done. Because again, you're asking, you're basically, what's the expression? You're having the, um, like the fox watch the chicken coop, or some expression like that, right? And that's basically, that's basically what you're doing Close by, um, by suggesting that <laughs> one government organization adopts a policy that holds itself accountable for behaviors that it wants itself to do, and it's the only one who has any accountability. Right, so the difference is, and, and Mr. Roth or Mr. Lewis, correct me if I'm misstating any of this, but the difference primarily between a law and a policy is the law is externally, legally enforceable, and a policy is not necessarily. Third parties can sue you to enforce it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Alex, I mean, to, to be clear, yes, somebody can file a suit against the village for Sue not getting our attendance record correct. posted on the website soon enough. Right, and, we and that get is the attendance record posted on the website soon enough, and there should be no question about that. If we are to say that we it are going to do them. government in a transparent way, then, like, let's stop dancing around it as we tend but to But is do. that attendance record more important than something that's mission critical that the clerk's office says this is more important than the attendance record? And by the way, I might have somebody sue me because I didn't put the voting considering, record. Considering that it would they take, have limited resources. Those cities are massive, Alex. Their budgets yeah, they are, are huge. Oh, we're we're to show, me, show me somebody who That's has a community doing. like ours with our limited bandwidth as is cities who can pass this kind of ordinance yeah, I, and open themselves up. Officer, Trustee Davis Ford, I know firsthand how thin we're stretched. And you, so you don't have to explain that to me, although I appreciate it. The difference but we're here the is talking about the records Right, that we've identified, okay. putting an attendance record online takes about 90 seconds. Right, there's a spreadsheet Every that lives on online. Every vote agenda? Yeah, that Sheena, takes probably about- Walter, yeah, Howard, yeah. Deborah, Alex, about, you, you voted yes on an administrative minutes, $10 spending. It would take about 10 or 15 minutes a meeting. Ow, absolutely. Alex. What, what, so, 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 Alex. so again, can we so have a straw what, poll? What we, we can absolutely take a straw poll, okay. but what I will but not- Trustee Rosner- But this clearly has nothing properly vetted. wait. Wait, oh. What I will not allow is for people to be confused about aspects of this. If the board is interested in doing this by resolution, that's fine. But 
Trustee Clark had a question about what the difference is. The major difference is accountability. You brought up how big of a deal it would be if we didn't get attendance records online, and I suggested that it's not that big of a deal because we've gone specifically through each of the exact stipulations that we, were, we would be required to do, and none of them are particularly time consuming. And in the legal committee, we discussed this, and we said if there are any time constraints that we need to make a little bit longer to make sure that we do meet them 100% of the time, we should. And again, this is just my personal opinion, those things should not be allowed to be missed. Government transparency is too important. So you're right, we have limited bandwidth, of course we do, but this is also our public's access to what we do as a government. Uh, I, would so, like to, I would like to make a motion to cut this conversation off and take our straw. Uh, I, the next thing out of my mouth was going to be asked if we wanted to take a straw poll. Yes. yes. So why don't we start down at the end, Trustee Clark. Just to clarify, that's the straw poll on this whole resolution. So I would suggest saying a yet an up or down on the ordinance. Yes. So a yes would be that you do want to pursue the ordinance, and no would be uh, not. So there's no option for an amended ordinance. No, let's uh, just do up I mean, and down. Your, you can certainly introduce I'm an amended. You ordinance if you'd like to. You're free to I do will, that. I, I will go with no for now. No. 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 No, I don't think it's worth a fun time. Based on the situation, no. Okay. So um, we are not going to pursue the ordinance. Um, I think the legal committee should be responsible for turning this into a resolution and bringing it back, considering Trustee Davis Ford has spoken about how much you're committed to doing it. Um, that way, so if you could make sure to add this to the agenda for the next legal committee um, and turn this ordinance into a resolution um, that unfortunately is much weaker than what a law would be, but um, you know, is certainly not a step backwards. Uh, so that's I, a win. I, I'd like to make another comment to that because uh, the resolution was only part of what I had requested. The other part is, is to have uh, structure and operating procedures uh, uh, to be developed on how you want to implement this. And I think we should now start moving forward with producing those operating procedures. You said in the ordinance 60 days. I'd like to have the clock start now. I would love if you would take that um, <laughs> comment more seriously. I take and, it very seriously. No, but take it more seriously and apply that to every single action item that would have a project plan. And so I would like to see you, Trustee Levison, again, take this and not pick out one ordinance to say, I want a project plan ahead of time. <coughs> like, let's see, why don't you work on a policy that would put a project plan in place for anything that we'd be doing that requires I've, I've been saying it for four years. I, I wanted a project management system. We played with project management systems. Uh, I agree that we should have it. I, I'm not only picking on this one. I think this one is prime for having one a plan, a structure, because it impacts a lot within our organization. Sure. And I, I don't mean to sound flip, but we should probably have a project plan for having project plans. And instead of just picking out one and saying, let's just do it for this one, it would be great if you would develop a way to do this for everything that we're doing. Is that something that you can do? Um, we've been trying for that. Um, okay. Can, yes. And I, actually, I will report on that the uh, Finance Committee agreed on a project plan structure that we could use. Great. That would be excellent. Um, all right, so let's move on to our next ordinance. Um, so, so actually what I would need is a motion um, <coughs> to, uh, to strike this ordinance. I move. What ordinance never was? Well, we tabled it from the last meeting. Oh. It's still there. So it's still there. So we have to pick so it up off the table first, right? Yeah, pick it up off the table. Yeah, so, so yeah. motion. I move to table. Table. Move by the Trustee Collum, seconded by Trustee Levison. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Now I have a motion to strike. Motion to strike. By Trustee Levison, Second. seconded by Trustee Davis Ford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Next ordinance. Ordinance 2015-07, an introduction and first reading of an ordinance to amend the township zoning map in order to set forth the boundaries of the previously approved and existing special district and overlay zone located in the university zone. Okay, uh, Trustee Reisner is the Chair of Planning and Zoning. Is there anything that you want to add? No, well, maybe Barry would like to explain. Yeah, um, I can explain this. Uh, there is within the Seton Hall campus and the overall <laughs> property, and there has been for years, there is a dividing line between two different zones. Uh, <laughs> and 
the line has existed on the zoning map, but it, it, in scale, it's basically a line that covers the entire property. Um, as Seton Hall has started to look at new um, improvements and things on the campus, the specific location of that line, because it does impact and the zones impact height, and specifically the uh, eastern side of the one zone has lower heights and stuff because it's closer to residential areas, uh, it became apparent in connection with an application before the planning board that just the line drawn on the zoning map was not sufficient to really pinpoint which buildings were where. Um, a surveyed meets and bounds description of the line was created, <coughs> reviewed by the village engineer, agreed to by Seton Hall, and ultimately then accepted by the planning board um, as the sort of zoomed in meets and bounds legal description of that line. Uh, the line has not moved, the zoning doesn't change, it just provides a again, a survey detail where you can zoom in and, and say where the line relates to specific uh, improvements on the on the campus. So uh, this came was the recommendation from, uh, the, again, the planning board approved it as it related and accepted it as the depiction of the line for a particular application, but rather than have to go through that on future applications, uh, the, the feeling is we should just adopt it as a supplement to the zoning map that basically gives you that zoomed in look of that line. Okay, questions or comments? <clears throat> I move. Moved by Trustee Levison. Second. Second. Seconded by Trustee Rosner. We have the roll, please. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collum? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levison? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Thank you. Ordinance 2015-08, introduction and first reading of an ordinance to amend the code of the Township of South Orange Village, section 92-162B6A with respect to awnings. Okay, is there any questions or comments here? Do you, yeah. Mr. Lewis, can yeah, you explain it first and then I'll... a brief explanation. Um, the, this is uh, sort of an interim measure, I think, a part of what will ultimately be a complete overhaul in connection with the business code review. Uh, but in connection with that process, we discovered that there was a conflict in the introductory paragraph that related to all signs, including awnings, that specifically allows uh, name, address, uh, principal product served, and something else. Then in the separate section relating to awnings, um, instead it says name, street number and, right. and overlooks and, and omitted the principal product served. Um, virtually all the other signs and, and again in the, the general paragraph, uh, the intent seemed to be and, and there didn't seem to be any logical reason why you would have different content permissible on signs, band signs, window signs, everything but awnings and particularly so uh, the recommendation was to reconcile the conflict by going with the one that's consistent with all the other um, means of signage. Uh, and again, we do think this, though, will ultimately lead to, and the business code review folks are doing a much more comprehensive review of all signs, but specifically also awnings, uh, to address a number of things that uh, I think they found were not the best practices in our current awning ordinance. But this is uh, sort of a uh, the, the short-term fix while that process plays out. But the only change here is then to make this consistent with the, the introductory general one that applies to all signs. Okay, any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I have a motion. I move. Moved by Trustee Collum. Second. Seconded by Trustee Rosner. Can we have the roll, please? Trustee Collum? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levinson? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Thank you. Ordinance 2015-09, introduction and first reading of an ordinance delegating the authority to approve the granting of raffle licenses to the village clerk. So this, uh, is, some, this is something that we used to do in the board meetings, um, and this is a enormous, special, unique power that is <laughs> able to be granted to the clerk. And I think we're all very confident that our clerk can handle doing the raffle license. Yeah, we, we were doing it. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we are doing it by resolution, but I spoke to the uh, Games and Control uh, Commission, and they want it done by resolution, I mean by ordinance, as, sp as stated in the statute, so we have to do it by ordinance. Okay. Okay. Just All right. So you know. is, there, is there a motion? Move. I move. 
Moved by Trustee Davis Ford. Seconded Second. by Trustee Rosner. Can we have the roll? Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levinson? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collum? Yes. I move that ordinance 2015-07, 2015-08, and 2015-09 be scheduled for a second reading and final passage at the May 11, 2015 board meeting and a public hearing be held at that time for the reference ordinance. The village clerk was authorized to take the necessary actions to publish public notice for such hearing. Okay, moved by Trustee Davis Ford. Second. Seconded by Trustee Reisner. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Ordinances for second reading 2015-04, excuse me, second reading and public hearing of a bond ordinance authorizing capital improvements by and for the township of South Orange Village in the County of Essex, New Jersey, appropriating an aggregate amount of $2,575,000. Therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to ex exceeding $2,446,250 <clears throat> in aggregate principal amount of bonds or notes to finan finance part of the cost thereof. <clears throat> okay. Um, seeing as this is the um, second reading of this ordinance, I'd like to open it up for public hearing. So if there's any member of the public who wishes to comment on this ordinance alone, if you'd like to speak. <coughs> Uh, seeing as there are no members of the public who wish to comment on this ordinance, we close the public hearing and ask for a motion. I move. Moved by Trustee Levison. Second. Seconded by Trustee Clark. Can we have the roll, please? Trustee Levison? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collum? Yes. Trustee Davis Ward? Yes. Thank you. Okay, resolutions 2015 73 through resolutions 2015 81 are on the consent agenda. Um, what I'd like to do is do uh, 21579 as a separate. And I have questions on um, 21581. Okay, what are your questions? Um, I'd just like uh, uh, it to be explained by the administrator <coughs> for uh, additional clarity. Um, this uh, resolution um, awards a contract to a vendor under a state contract, FAIA card services, and then uh, provides for us to establish um, a procedure. The state of New Jersey created what are called procurement cards. It's a P card. Um, historically, villages or, or municipalities didn't have just like a visa card or whatever. Uh, but recognizing that circumstances arose, uh, occasionally where that level of or ability to purchase was in play and also um, they are tied to provisions that can re essentially get cash back if you will uh, for utilizing the mm -hmm. procurement card so there's an opportunity to get revenue um, it's a state authorized procedure the state has begun using them in the state agencies uh, this establishes certain policies and procedures um, that, you know, I think are fairly tightly controlled. This was reviewed at some length with the Finance Committee, so certainly Trustee Levison could weigh in as well. Um, it, it provides us an opportunity to uh, do a couple things. One, be more efficient in, um, in paying vendors in, in certain occasions. Two, uh, particularly because you can even use them for some of our big ticket recurring items, such as uh, utilities, phone bills, gas bills, that are significant. So when you start getting a percentage back as a cash back, that can add up to real money as well. So um, it, it certainly comes with the administrative recommendation, and, and I'll defer to uh, uh, chairman of the Finance Committee, Trustee Levison, to speak to it. Yeah, th th there are a number of um, vendors that require you to pay by credit card rather than by a purchase order. We'll not accept the purchase order. Um, these have been software products that we've been using. Um, as long as we have a proper reconciliation, we talked about this, we spoke about this at the meeting, as, l as long as we have the proper reconciliation process, um, and it's reflected on the bills list, which we talked about getting the details associated mm -hmm. to the PCOT, because all you're going to have is one line item entry. Mm -hmm. We'll have additional report that details out the various things that were charged under the PCOT. Okay. And the, the other is, is that, it, as uh, Barry said, we do get some uh, money back on, on the, uh, the charges. No. And what, what's important to note about this too actually is that when you do need to use a credit card, people use their own personal credit right. cards and have to get reimbursed, which is not a best practice really. Which is something that we shouldn't be doing. Right, and it's not, and it's not something that anybody wants to do. Um, and so this would eliminate that also because then mm -hmm. the village would have a credit card. Correct. Mm -hmm. 
And who would be, who would get the card? Trusty Levison and the travel points. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it's spelled out. In yeah, the, it's spelled it's out, out in, in the resolution. Okay. Yeah, in the policy. Um, yeah. the, and no, there I would, just want to put it on for the record. Right, it, it's CFO, administrator, purchasing agent, deputy administrator, and they are uh, limited. The only, um, the thresholds are, are fairly low with the only, one, only the CFO would have the one that would be used for utilities and, and bigger ticket bills. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And are there any other questions? Yes. On 73, I had asked the question of what was this past uh, 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 contract? What was the rate that we had? Do you know, Barry? Pardon me? What was the, the rate on the uh, recycling uh, leap? No. Uh, Just to compare it against what it, it currently is. It's not going to hold it up. I'll find it and I'll let you know. Okay. Fairly. Are you waiting for information? Or no, no, no. Okay. Are there any other questions? No, Barry said he would get it to me. <coughs> you wanted to pull out 79? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. I so move. are we good with the consent agenda? <coughs> minus 79? Yes. Yeah, I move. Okay. Move by Trustee Column. Second. Second by Trustee Davis Ford. We have the roll, please. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Column? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee yes. Levinson? Thank you. Okay. We discussing 79? Yeah. Please. You can do 79. Okay. Resolution 2015-79, resolution to reappoint Gracias Robert Montalus to the position of municipal prosecutor in the township of South Orange Village. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that we voted on that separately. I think you know we're all very pleased um, with his performance and happy to renew the contract. And so we want to make sure to pull that out. Um, so do I have a motion? I move. I move. Moved by Trustee Davis Ford, seconded <coughs> by Trustee Hudson. Uh, we have the roll. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collin? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levinson? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, resolution for separate action, resolution 2015-82, resolution of the Township of South Orange Village, authorizing and approving a person-to-person -person and place-to-place -place transfer application from Town Hall Delegatessen of South Orange, Inc. to Morgan Liquors, Inc., or LLC, I should say. Okay. Any questions, comments? Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. Convene. You have to convene. Uh, What's that? You have to convene. Convene. Yeah. To pass this resolution? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Do I have a motion to go out? Um, to recess the Board of Trustees meeting and to reconvene as the Alcohol Beverage Control Board? I move. Okay. Moved. Uh, seconded. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right. I'd like to call this meeting of the Alcohol Beverage Control Board. Let it show that the attendance is the same. We have run one resolution to consider tonight. Can we read it again? Yeah. Resolution of the Township of South Orange Village authorizing and approving a person-to-person, place-to-place liquor license transfer application from Town Hall Delegatessen of South Orange, Inc. to Morgan's Liquors, LLC. Just for the record, a background check was done. And yes, it was. It is in stuff. the file. Okay. It's perfectly fine with the police department. And... Uh, all the paperwork is in yeah. from the state. I've spoken All to right. the state. They're just waiting for us, for you All folks right. to make Thank a move. You. I'm over. Okay. Moved by Trustee Rosner. Second. Seconded by Trustee Levison. Can we have the roll, please? <coughs> Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Column? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levinson? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion to, uh, to uh, adjourn uh, the Alcohol uh, Beverage Control move. Board? Move. And Resume as the Board of Trustees. Yes, moved right by right. Trustee Levison, seconded sure. by Trustee Rosner. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, welcome back. Let's move on to the uh, trustee reports, which I'm sure will be long and thorough, starting with Trustee Collum. <laughs> real, real quick while you're checking your notes for Trustee Levison, the current bid was $8.40 per cubic yard. The old contract was eight sixty. I, I couldn't hear you. The uh, it, the old contract was eight dollars and sixty five cents per cubic guard. This one's eight dollars and forty cents. It's actually lower. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. 
Colin? Uh, just a quick question for Trustee Rosner. Because your planning and zoning isn't on here tonight, do you want to cover, do you want me to cover some of those conversations that we've had and what we're doing this week? Oh, I, can, I can do that if you want. You can do it in your report. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. Um, we had a request from the residents at Orange Lawn to discuss um, the the first reading that was introduced via ordinance and after sitting down with them um, they had a lot of great points uh, they wanted the board to consider the option that would give the most control over the totality of that property so we're having a follow-up meeting with them this week to go over what would constitute a redevelopment plan for the whole site again uh, retaining greater control for the village on behalf of the residents um, in looking at the totality of the um, site uh, a redevelopment plan again through the use of our rehab designation will allow us to be a lot more specific and detailed in what would be acceptable on on the land uh, it's just more controlled in zoning alone uh, so mr. Lewis do you have anything <coughs> to add to that no I, I think that's correct and I uh, again these the red these were residents not of orange lawn residents <laughs> <the> neighborhood <laughs> surrounding the neighborhood orange lawn, yes right. sorry about that um, and so we're following up with that meeting. There's no action tonight. Um, they have come up with some conceptual drawings that they want uh, the developer to look at, and we're just trying to figure out the best mechanism and vehicle um, to get people to some level of resolution between the residents and the club. So stay tuned for that. Um, and the residents have been meeting with the club as well. Yes, that's correct. Um, Irvington Avenue, we have Clean Up Green Up coming up on... Let me just pull it up really quick. Does anybody know the date off the top of their head? Alyssa, I gotta, Alyssa, you've always got it. Yep, here we are. It's April 26th from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Um, this is now becoming an annual event that we're doing on Irvington Avenue, and you can RSVP on Facebook. Um, and a special thanks to Olivia Lewis Chang and Tracy Randonelli for organizing this event. And if anybody from the board is available, please come join us. Um, public safety is next week is we are launching the Coffee with a Cop program. Hopefully everybody's seen it. It's been marketed April 23rd at First Baptist Church. Um, please help spread the word. We're hoping for a really good turnout for the first event. And also um, a thanks to Trustee Clark, who helped us create the positive behavior citations. He's a much better designer than I will ever be. Um, and so that was sent to the print house, so we should be starting to see the enforcement. He's of, really talented. Uh, recognizing they're, he is. They're actually delivered today. Uh, so desk. they're delivered today. Perfect. So um, very shortly, um, just a recap, I guess, is that our police department is going to be issuing citations to youth. Um, that they see exhibiting some level of good behavior, and um, they note on the ticket what what you know they observed. The student, kid, whomever can bring it back to their parents or whomever else to show them that that they were awarded something. And then the tear off. Now this is what's really exciting is for a slice of pizza or an ice cream. So a special thanks to Pirates Pizza and Cold Stone uh, Creamery for for being very generous partners in this initiative. Um, public safety is going to meet in two weeks. Um, I'll have more updates after that. And <coughs> as of today, uh, we got some concerns from residents regarding the train station. It's something we've been working on, obviously, in public safety with dealing with the situation there along with the village president. Um, we're getting a report from the police chief and what the past month has looked like. And um, we're still getting requests, though, about just uh, some quality of life issues within the station and so trustee Rosner has followed up with New Jersey Transit and we're going to try and put together a meeting following the next public safety committee meeting and then lastly as Mr. Lewis alluded to we've got a lot of stuff going on in the code review we needed kind of a stopgap with this awnings ordinance but um, hopefully within the next you know few weeks or so you'll start seeing a lot more coming up including the creation of the design review board just to add up on the New Jersey Transit, the uh, meeting with the, uh, we plan on meeting with them and they did respond uh, and open to, to the meeting, but I also told them there's going to be some other issues besides homelessness and, you know, specifically about uh, sprucing up the station again, which they haven't done in quite some time, mm -hmm. and not just the interior, but also the uh, exterior and the area that they own, from including the uh, steps and adding two more bike racks. Last point, I, I, I alluded to it before, but the development committee also met with the residents from um, 
the seat and village area and so the we have not asked for the development committee to make any recommendations because we're not there yet so at least we went through the process where we were um, and so right now they're inactive when it comes to that proposed development and they're they've put their efforts towards um, orange lawn that's it okay thank you trustee davis forward um, we spent uh, we met last monday and we spent a significant amount of the meeting uh, talking uh, about the open democracy or ordinance and we um, had a robust and thorough discussion here tonight so there's nothing else for me to add um, we also um, with the remainder of the time I'm only going to touch on two other items which again was stuck discuss here tonight and that was the um, uh, Seton Hall special district so there's no need to belabor that anymore that was discussed earlier in the meeting and the final thing that was discussed or brought up that I'm going to talk about tonight was the charter uh, petition and it was determined that we were going to table it because there were some other areas regarding the charter petition that we wanted to explore <coughs> and so we we put that on hold as far as moving forward that was um, presented um, uh, at our legal and uh, our personnel meeting last week so with that said that's my report Okay, Trustee Levison. Yes, uh, <laughs> last Friday uh, we had our finance and IT committee meeting. Um, one of the items was um, reviewing the budget, which is currently at 1.8%. Uh, there were a number of items that we're uh, still discussing uh, to see if we can lower that, uh, on a, uh, lower the pr uh, proposed rate. Uh, some of the items uh, in addition that uh, were discussed uh, proposed increase in the sewer fee uh, in a couple uh, couple ways. We want to drop the special assessment since uh, uh, the litigation is, is now uh, bas basically abated. Um, but uh, what we want to do is, uh, and that was a $25 special assessment uh, let in the last two years, uh, but what we want to do is uh, now raise the base from uh, 260, uh, 260 uh, to 280. Uh, part, of, part of that is, is that uh, we haven't had an uh, increase over the past years and represent the CP CPI impact to the rate. Um, there are a number of things that um, the uh, joint meeting is about to do, um, and, and in fact they have just uh, issued a bond, uh, and I think we uh, was part of the special uh, bills list uh, today. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. Uh, uh, they've issued a, a bond for uh, some capital work uh, in which we were res we are responsible for $480,000 uh, of, of that uh, bond issue. Uh, that was uh, given to the New Jersey Envi uh, Environmental Infrastructure Trust, uh, and in fact, uh, we have a $98,000 forgiveness associated to that. And most of it is going to be at uh, zero percent interest rate, but that just reflects the kinds of uh, catch-up that's being made by the joint meeting uh, and uh, monies required for supporting those activities. Um, and so that's one of the proposals on the table. The other proposal uh, was to increase uh, by five cents uh, <coughs> the uh, South Orange component of the water rate. Uh, we have since inception had a 65 cent uh, <coughs> per uh, 100 cubic feet um, addition that comes directly to the village, which is basically for capital improvements in the system. Um, we're embarking on uh, switching the water systems uh, to New Jersey American, and we do have some capital improvements that we need to make in the system <coughs> as we move forward now that we're taking on the responsibility of that system. Um, the other um, decision that, that we've made is that we will uh, purchase base camp for our various uh, uh, community committees. Um, one, of the other, one of the other requests, and May coming up for uh, the next tax payment, uh, I've asked if we could uh, have support uh, at the window uh, for somebody to show people who come in who want to pay their taxes with a check that they can do it online, uh, and rather than uh, coming into the uh, uh, the village, they could do it online uh, themselves. Uh, 
the other is, is to encourage people to use the online system rather than using their, their checking account uh, uh, to send in a check. It, it significantly in, in enhances the process that the uh, <coughs> tax collector's office uh, uses. Um, we talked about the peak card before and passing uh, the resolution for it. Um, and last, uh, we settled on using Rike software for our project management. It represents uh, either $45 a month or uh, $100 a month, depending upon the number of users that we're planning on using. Um, we'll develop structure for using the Rike softwares to right now project management uh, for all of the, uh, the various uh, implementations that we're about to do for the next, uh, into the future. Um, I hope to do uh, some prototypes with our IT people uh, for some of the IT implementations that are coming up uh, very shortly. Okay, Trustee Schnall. All right, on the cultural arts report, um, the, all the gateway murals are now up. Um, they are not so easy to, to be seen. You actually have to proactively um, make an effort to go into <coughs> the gateway. So um, right off of South Orange Avenue, if you walk in through that archway, through the gateway, look to the right basically where the train trestle is, uh, you will see lovely um, murals that are, that are on the wall that were put up. Uh, the gateway actually supported it and financed it. Um, they are all uh, scenes of various different aspects of our community of South Orange, um, and they're quite lovely. So take a look at them. They're, they're hopefully going to stay around for several months, but they're outdoors and they are exposed. Um, so I do suggest taking a look. Um, this coming up April 19th is the last of this year, of the 2015 series for Jazz in the Loft, so last chance to do that. And I'd like to make a, a kind of a fun announcement. Um, we are making a little change in terms of the programming for the, what's now being called the South Orange Summer Nights. So we have uh, in the past had our, our Wednesday uh, music on the hill and in recent years added movies. We are now gonna combine them uh, and the purpose of doing that is also uh, to raise sponsorships. I like that. Yeah, so it'll be great on Wednesday nights. Look out in July for your five music concerts, and August we'll have three movies. The only okay. difference this year, there will be no relocation in case of rain. So it's, uh, if, if it does rain, we will pull back from that. Uh, on the recreation side, we are heading uh, for the second annual Kids Triathlon between South Orange and Maplewood. This year it will be in Maple Crest Park, Maplewood. Um, and those are for youths only from ages, I believe, 6 to 14, and registration will begin in a short period of time. Registration will begin, uh, actually, we're also taking a look at the preparation for summer camps, as well as planning for the pool <coughs> operations. Uh, something I actually want to mention to the board uh, <coughs> that we discussed at the latest rec committee is better ways to attract lifeguards and swim instructors. So um, each year we go through this, we try to recruit uh, young folks to who, uh, get to twirl the whistle, put on a pretty cool bathing suit, and, and uh, hang out in the sun all summer. Um, but for whatever reason, it's been a challenge, so um, we're looking to find a little bit uh, unique ways to try to att attract um, lifeguards so we can all be safe swimming. Um, with regard to Grove Park, um, the assistant uh, recreation director is putting in a distances on the pathway. So those of you who are familiar with Grove Park, again, right off of South Orange Avenue, uh, we often have uh, individuals walking around the outside, which is not very safe. It's, it's, it's in the road. It's an inconvenience. Um, so we're trying to encourage people to actually walk or run or recreate uh, inside the park and to encourage that, we're actually putting up distances. There'll be little post signs to let you know how far you're, you're, uh, you're covering. Um, lastly, on the recreation side, I do want, I'm sad to say that um, the tennis courts are really under, unfortunately, a, a pretty bad state of disrepair. So much so that our Columbia High School Athletic Director has asked to move the varsity team um, from the courts that are typically, they typically have been playing behind the middle school. Um, those courts are in, in not very good shape and uh, the varsity team will be playing 
by the Baird courts. Unfortunately, the reason I make this announcement um, is that will take away a little bit of our residents' ability to, to play uh, under their just recreation because the high school will have precedent here. Um, one of the implications of that is we will need to take a look at from a budgetary and, and capital standpoint what it will take to uh, redo those tennis courts. They are very expensive as well as we would look at uh, night lighting as well to improve that. Uh, moving on, I want to um, engage and, and thank those people who were involved in the uh, volunteer summit that was, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago uh, here in the loft, uh, sponsored by the Community Relations Committee. I thought they did a really nice job. There were a number of volunteer-based uh, nonprofits and service organizations that attended, uh, discussed several different issues about recruiting and running um, nonprofits here in the village, and I thought that was... Uh, those of you who were able to attend, I thought that was really nice. Uh, another event coming up here in SOPAC will be the annual gala. That is the end of May, Saturday night, May 30th. Um, Brian Stokes Mitchell will be the lead performer. Uh, there are tickets available. I hope to see most of you guys on the board there uh, and joining me. I think that's going to be a fabulous event. And, of course, it's an important fundraiser. There will be, both a, there will be a silent auction as well for some nice little goodies. And lastly, um, the work with on South by South Orange continues. That event, uh, as I've stated before, is slated to be the last weekend in June, 26th, 27th, and 28th of June. We are finalizing the programming for that. I expect to be able to uh, release a beta site uh, website that will have all the programming hopefully in the next two weeks. The website will be southbysouthorange.org or <coughs> sox.so.com.org. That's what I got. Thank you. Trustee stuff. Davis Ford, there was one additional. Uh, yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to make sure that I thanked um, St. Andrews and uh, Reverend Sandy for mm -hmm. opening up her uh, church and um, Barnabas Health for uh, supplying us with a chef um, um, and who and a nutritionist who talked about how to prepare uh, healthy food uh, and that tastes good. And uh, on the menu was uh, grilled salmon and with uh, with uh, and uh, uh, a grain. I cannot pronounce it correctly. It begins with Q. Quinoa. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> um, a sauté kale and and then a dessert that was. Um, uh, frozen yogurt with toasted coconuts and pineapple uh, soap and brandy. <laughs> and this was all healthy, low, uh, good kind of fat, and it was really, really well. And they left us with recipes and everything like that. And um, I want to thank John Festa for, and Adam for doing a good job. And it's going to be twice a year, one, one in the spring, and we'll do another one in the fall. So I just wanted to make sure that I thank everyone uh, awesome. for that. Can I just add to Trustee Schnall's report? I, I don't know if we told the board or not, but Trustee Schnall was the last month's winner for the South Orange Ooh, Health and Fitness Challenge. It's fixed. A fix. So let's, it's let's fixed. Let's be really clear. For the record, before we adjourn, this girl right here, month one, second place, that guy right over there, first place, second month. And so Sobot might take the challenge Ooh. if but, Trustee Rosner. But, yeah, but you know. <laughs> Trusty Schnall gained 10 pounds the month before. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll bring in our ringer, Trusty Clark, to uh, take us to the final month. <laughs> okay, I have a motion to adjourn. I move. Moved by Trusty Column. Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. All right. Good night. Every community has its own guidelines for what, when, and how to recycle. In general, here are a few things to keep in mind. If your town has provided recycling bins, check the lid for guidelines, make a call, or visit your municipal website.